Всем добрый вечер. History. Good afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you're tuning in from. Welcome to Tochny. And a picture of Irina Halle, the first Ukrainian woman to climb Everest, pictured here this week atop Mount Annapurna. On day 780 of this invasion, we thought we'd bring you the past exploits of chess player Yuri Rastropin, who, along with fellow chess player Ilya Oskina, gave their lives this week. Yuri Rastropin, born in 1998, 26, when he died fighting for Ukraine, we thought one story behind the headlines with Yuri is that his rating with the Chess Federation FIDE was clearly impacted by the 2014 invasion of Ukraine. His rating can be seen here on the blue line on the chart in front of you. His lack of official FIDE matches after 2013, the number shown in the middle, his official ranking and the number of games he actually played in the right-hand column, this impact is apparent. After 2013, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine's east, that number comes to an abrupt halt. Yuri's matches from 2013 show a player who anticipated his opponent's styles of play. Here he is, as black, playing a Sicilian defence. And as white, here's Yuri playing the Slavic version of the Queen's Gambit. Both of which games he won. Like all good chess players, Yuri studied his opponents and adapted his moves to win against them. Yuri Rastropin and Ilya Oskina, Ukraine's greatest generation for this week. And our introduction also, as here at Tochny, we are, of course, a podcast on a range of platforms interviewing a variety of groups involved in this war, groups like the Wild Hornets, and our research was of course published in The Economist. But we'll now move on, because we are fortunate today to have two notable pieces of research and analysis this week on missiles, munitions, and more, from contributors John Ridge and Colby. But first, I'll hand over to Joseph for news and a Q&A on that news, and more. So please bring your questions at any time, Whatever you want to say, we definitely want to hear them. So, over to you, Joseph. Thank you, Jonathan. So uh, I'll get straight into the news. During his visit to Lithuania for the Three Seas Initiative International Summit on April 11th, President Volodymyr Zelensky, along with Latvian President Edgar Rinkovics, ratified a 10-year bilateral security pact, as announced by the President of Ukraine. Additionally, Zelensky revealed on Telegram that Latvia has committed to providing approximately 112 million euros in military assistance to Ukraine throughout the year 2024, along with further aid for reconstruction, safeguarding critical infrastructure, demining efforts, unmanned technology, and cybersecurity. Prior to this agreement, Ukraine has entered into similar security agreements with eight other nations, including Finland, the UK, Germany, France, Denmark, Canada, Italy, and the Netherlands. These pacts stem from a commitment made by the G7 nations last July. Under the terms of this deal, Latvia has committed to allocating 0.25% of its gross domestic product uh, annually to support Ukraine. So in other words, 0.25% of its GDP annually. Latvia has also pledged assistance in cyber defense, demining, oh, I already mentioned all that. Uh, Zelensky expressed gratitude towards uh, Latvia, emphasizing the importance of such steadfast support in Ukraine's uh, resistance against the Russian invasion. Uh, the prime minister also recently disclosed that the aid so far has uh, totaled approximately 392 million euros. Um, this includes an upcoming defense assistance package uh, slated for April. Ukrainian Defense Minister Rustem Umarov and Minister of Strategic Industries Alexander Kamishin have signed a framework agreement on defense and industrial cooperation with the British government, as reported by the Ukrainian Defense Ministry press service. 
Umarov expressed gratitude towards the UK, highlighting it as uh, one of Ukraine's most steadfast allies. He urged representatives of numerous British countries to invest in Ukraine and establish joint ventures in the country. Commission emphasized the important role of the UK in the Ukrainian security framework, noting that it was the first country to sign a security agreement with Ukraine and that British defense companies were the first to establish offices in Ukraine after the onset of the full-scale invasion. He highlighted the evolving partnership and expressed optimism that British manufacturers would soon produce weaponry in Ukraine. Greg Hands, Minister of State for Trade Policy, signed the agreement on behalf of the British government, and uh, this was uh, done at a defense uh, partnership conference, industrial defense partnership conference. The agreement is geared towards addressing uh, all. Yeah, that's well. It's it's all the standard security stuff. Uh, the signing occurred uh, as part of the UK's largest trade mission to Ukraine, with 29 UK businesses seeking opportunities for cooperation and showcasing their expertise. Uh, as part of the mission, UK defense company BAE Systems, uh, which makes uh, artillery systems uh, in particular, along with many other things, uh, they signed a contract with the UK uh, Ministry of Defense to maintain and repair L119 light artillery guns gifted to Ukraine. Uh, and this should facilitate quicker frontline deployment and supporting Ukraine's uh, defense infrastructure. President of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, engaged in a phone discussion with Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte, uh, during which he received confirmation that the Netherlands has earmarked an additional 1 billion euros for military aid to Ukraine and an extra 400 million for reconstruction efforts. Zelensky conveyed the news via telegram, as reported by European Pravda, stating that these funds were allocated on top of the Netherlands' current commitments within their bilateral security agreement. The discussion uh, between the president and the prime minister focused on uh, collaborative efforts with uh, partners to expedite the delivery of artillery rounds, ammunition, and air defense systems. Uh, Zelensky updated Root on preparations for the peace summit in Switzerland that's coming up and extended an invitation for the Netherlands to participate. They also deliberated on necessary steps to engage as many countries in the peace process as possible. Uh, Root confirmed uh, that this was uh, an, this 1 billion euros was in addition to the 2 million, uh, sorry, this 1 billion euros was in addition to the 2 billion euros that I uh, reported on, I believe, last week or the week before. So in other words, it's a total of 3 billion in uh, bilateral military aid so far for the upcoming year, because I wanted to make sure of that, because um, I remember that they sent 2 billion uh, not, not long ago, that this 1 billion wasn't uh, part of that. As far as I understand, it's not. Uh, so next uh, topic, Prime Minister Denis Michal announced on April 12th that the government has earmarked an additional 100 million uh, USD worth of uh, budget for fortification and reconstruction, sorry, fortification construction efforts in Ukraine. Usually I say reconstruction in the Ukrainian context, but this is about building uh, defensive fortifications. Uh, approximately 43 million will be allocated to bolster defenses in Kharkiv. Uh, while 38 million will be directed to Sumy Oblast. Uh, further funding will be provided to Donetsk, Kherson, and Mykolaiv. Uh, criticism has been leveled at the Ukrainian authorities for the slow pace of progress in fortifying defensive lines. In March, President Volodymyr Zelensky announced the construction of 2,000 kilometers of fortifications across three defensive lines, and he noted that while the task is substantial, progress is being made. Shmihal stated in January that the Ukrainian government has so far allocated 512 million USD for fortification construction uh, in 2024. According to a report by the Wall Street Journal, uh, Ukrainian troops are fortifying positions currently in anticipation of a potential Russian offensive in the spring, um, although concerns uh, still remain about the pace of Russian progress now. Uh, these concerns of a spring offensive were also echoed by Zelensky in a recent interview. In other words, uh, it seems like these fortification efforts are in, in anticipation of this uh, Russian upcoming offensive. Uh, next topic. Ukraine's parliament, the Verkhovna Rada, approved a bill for the reestablishment of Ukraine's Bureau of Economic Security on April 11th. According to Yaroslav Zelazniak, the first deputy chairman of the parliament's tax committee, a total of 264 lawmakers voted in favor of the bill during the first reading. Zelazniak uh, emphasized that uh, David Arachamila, the leader of the parliamentary coalition, has committed to revising the draft law to align with the requirements of the IMF 
G7, and business stakeholders. Uh, while the revised government draft law incorporated some proposals from business associations, such as the election of the BES head by a commission with a majority vote from international experts and immediate recertification of all BES staff, it omitted other crucial proposals deemed essential for BES's successful reboot. Sorry, just to uh, reiterate, BES uh, stands for the Bureau of Economic Security, which is an institution that uh, would help regulate uh, Ukrainian economic institutions. Uh, these include the establishment of a clear procedure uh, for staff recertification with safeguards against the reinstatement of unfit employees by courts, the inclusion of international experts on personnel boards, the enhancement of BES's analytical function with free access to state information systems, the implementation sorry, the implementation of performance criteria with uh, continuous monitoring and the granting of personnel boards, uh, the authority to assess candidates' integrity during recertification based on facts and documents. In other words, uh, the, the law that is currently under discussion, there's a group in Ukraine, I would say a pretty significant group in civil society that don't believe that this law goes far enough to ensure the integrity and um, authority of the body. So there's people advocating that it should be uh, stronger. Uh, business associations argue that failure to incorporate these proposals increases the risk of retaining personnel lacking integrity, potentially undermining the inf uh, effectiveness of the organization. Uh, previously, parliamentary committees approved the government's version of the BES reform bill, despite opposition from Ukrainian business associations. Uh, G7 ambassadors urged a transparent leadership reboot and integrity checks for all BES staff. The parliament did not pass the government's bill on BES reform in February, following objections from G7 ambassadors and Ukrainian business associations. The Committee on Finance, Taxation, and Customs Policy proposed a new version of the bill without input from business or approval from foreign partners. So uh, we definitely hope that some form of the bill gets passed, but it seems like there's maybe some work to be done in terms of making sure that the, the bill itself is effective in, in completing its task. The Financial Times has reported that leading European arms manufacturers such as Saab from Sweden and Rheinmetall from Germany have expressed concerns about their significant reliance on Chinese materials used in the production of gunpowder. Europe's heavy dependence on cotton linters from China, which account for nearly half of the global trade, was highlighted by these manufacturers. Cotton linters are a primary ingredient in the production of nitrocellulose, commonly known as smokeless gunpowder which is utilized in various types of ammunition, including cartridges and rocket weapons. China's dominant role in the global cotton linters market is evident with the International Trade Center indicating that China contributes to about half of the total global trade. Major importers of this material include Germany, Sweden, and Belgium, which are the key ammunition producers within the EU. Armin Papper Berger, sorry, Armin Papperger, the CEO of Rheinmetall, revealed to the Financial Times that Europe relies on China for more than 70% of its cotton linters. However, he also noted a shortage of materials in the market and expressed concerns about the risk of China potentially withholding linters. Rheinmetall, uh, Rheinmetall reported that it's taken proactive measures by stockpiling a three-year supply of linters following the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Considering the potential risks, Rheinmetall is contemplating establishing their own linters production unit in Lower Saxony as part of a new ammunition manufacturing facility. Saab echoed similar concerns, acknowledging the increased future risk posed by the reliance on China while emphasizing there are currently no supply chain issues for them. Uh, the company suggests that in the long run, alternative methods of manufacturing critical materials, particularly utilizing wood, may need to be explored as a contingency plan. Russia, meanwhile, has uh, currently uh, a very small share of gunpowder production in its ammunition manufacturing, and it's actively seeking additional sources of materials. Rostec State Corporation has initiated the commercial production of gunpowder from alternative raw materials like wood and flax pulp. According to the Industrial Director of Weapons, Ammunition, and Special Chemicals at Rostec, the share of new raw materials in gunpowder production is expected to reach about 70% in the future. Despite these efforts, Russia still relies heavily on importing nitrocellulose and other materials to produce the, the gunpowder that it does. According to U.S. data, China has significantly ramped up its exports of machine tools, microelectronics, and other technologies to Russia, uh, which Moscow utilizes in the manufacturing of missiles, tanks, 
aircraft and other weaponry for its conflict with Ukraine. Sources speaking on the condition of anonymity uh, to several media outlets, including Reuters and uh, AR, disclosed that in 2023, approximately 90% of Russia's microelectronics imports originated from China, and that 70% of Russia's new machine tool imports, uh, valued at about a billion dollars in the last quarter of 2023, were also sourced from China. Additionally, there are collaborative efforts between Chinese and Russian firms to establish drone production facilities inside Russia. Chinese companies are also expected to supply Russia with nitrocellulose and uh, essential uh, rocket fuels uh, for production. Uh, U.S. officials citing intelligence reports also revealed that China would be furnishing uh, satellite imagery. Uh, Next topic. In the wake of uh, targeted strikes of Ukrainian energy infrastructure by Russia in recent weeks, uh, Ukraine's power supply suffered significant damage, and the EU acted to provide emergency assistance to Ukraine. Uh, The European Commission announced on Tuesday that Austria, Germany, Sweden, and the Netherlands had provided 157 power generators of various sizes through the EU Civil Protection Mechanism. Uh, The Joint Stock Energy Company of Ukraine has increased its daily average electricity imports from the EU uh, by double since mid-March in order to counterbalance losses with Ukraine's power grid. According to the press service of the ECU, the state-owned energy trader is maintaining its electricity imports from Slovakia and Romania while commencing imports from Hungary as of March. Currently, the company holds the position as the second largest importer of electricity to Ukraine. Vitaly Butenko, CEO of ECU, emphasized the significant enhancement of Ukraine's technical and organizational capabilities for electricity imports in collaboration with the EU over the past two years. In other words, they've been hooking up a lot of power lines uh, to integrate the energy grid with the EU. Uh, This development now serves as a critical component in ensuring stable energy provisions to consumers. Given the persistent large-scale assaults on energy infrastructure, the Ukrainian government maintains uh, an active engagement in cooperating with European counterparts to secure additional import opportunities for energy. Next topic. Two Russian oligarchs have achieved an unexpected legal victory against EU sanctions related to Moscow's conflict with Ukraine, although they remain subject to punitive measures as of now. The European Court of Justice ruled that the European Council had not provided sufficient evidence to demonstrate that uh, Peter Avon and Mikhail Fridman were involved in actions that, quote, undermine or threaten the territorial integrity, sovereignty, and independence of Ukraine. Sanctions imposed on both uh, from 2022 to 2023 were annulled by the court. Avon and Fridman were added to the EU sanctions list shortly after the full-scale invasion, Uh, The European Council labeled Avon as one of Vladimir Putin's closest oligarchs and described Fridman as having strong ties to the Kremlin uh, and being a top Russian financier and enabler of Putin's inner circle. Alongside other Russian oligarchs, uh, Avon and Fridman contested the sanctions in EU courts, arguing that they were baseless and groundless. The Court of Justice determined on Wednesday that the billionaire should not have been included on a list that was circulated February 2022, and this ruling is perceived as a significant setback to the EU sanction strategy against Moscow, although the European Council does have the option to appeal the ruling. Uh, Restrictive measures were reinstated on the two individuals by the EU in March of 2023, and uh, they remained sanctioned. Uh, The recent ruling is likely to also facilitate the removal of these sanctions against the billionaires in a separate appeal against uh, the March 2023 decision. In other words, there were two separate rounds of sanctions imposed on these guys. The first round was shot down. Um, The second round is likely to also be shot down based on what happened the first time, but it's still a separate legal decision. Uh, So I'll just uh, move on to the next item from there. The European Council has issued a statement announcing the adoption of a law that establishes EU-wide regulations for prosecuting violations of circumvention of EU sanctions within member states. Since the outset of Russia's aggression against Ukraine in 2022, the EU has enacted a total of 13 sets of sanctions targeting individuals and sectors of economies in the aggressor country. Uh, The 13th uh, round of sanctions are targeted at 106 individuals and 88 legal entities, and uh, they're working on a 14th package uh, that should be implemented in the early spring. 
Uh, despite these efforts, uh, Russia does continue to find ways to violate the sanctions uh, through uh, partner companies in Europe. Uh, and the European Council basically uh, stated that under the new law, certain actions, such as assisting in bypassing travel bans, trading in sanctioned goods, or engaging in prohibited financial activities will now be considered criminal offenses in all member states. The law also penalizes inciting, aiding, and abetting to these offenses. Uh, member states are required to ensure that violating EU sanctions carries effective and proportionate criminal penalties, with the maximum penalty being imprisonment for intentional violations. Additionally, uh, individuals who breach EU restrictive measures uh, may also face fines. Uh, furthermore, legal entities, including companies, can be held accountable if individuals in leadership positions within the organization commit offenses. Sanctions uh, against entities may include disqualifications from conducting business activities and the re revocation of permits and authorizations uh, to do business. The Office of Foreign Assets Control, also known as OFAC, within the U.S. Department of Treasury, has declared a prohibition on the importation of aluminum, copper, and nickel originating from Russia. The pertinent document has been published on the agency's official website. As a consequence, the import and introduction of aluminum, copper, and nickel uh, has... Oh, sorry. I, this is just a re reiteration of the statement. Uh, OFAC specified that U.S. companies are barred from engaging in transactions involving metals uh, of Russian origin, and uh, this includes export and re-export. Uh, it stipulated that these restrictions will not apply to metals from the Russian uh, Federation that were manufactured before April 13th of 2024. Uh, authorities in the U.S. and the U.K. have jointly decided to, to curtail the utilization of Russian aluminum, copper, and nickel on global metal exchanges, and the London Metal Exchange, uh, known as LME, uh, and the Chicago Mercantile Exchange uh, will uh, forbid accepting Russian metals produced uh, after April 13th. Uh, next topic. During the Business Wisdom Summit in Kyiv, Konstantin Vetcher, the uh, B2B director of Kyivstar, um, actually, if you could go to the next video, Mr. Video Man, please. Thank you. Uh, during the Business Wisdom Summit in Kyiv, uh, the B2B director of Kyivstar announced that the largest Ukrainian mobile operator would serve as the official representative of the British company OneWeb in Ukraine, enabling the provision of high-speed broadband satellite internet access services as an alternative to Starlink. Vetcher highlighted that Keevstar is currently conducting uh, tests with OneWeb technologies for certain defense forces and will assume the role of the company's official representative in Ukraine, extending these services to business as well. Uh, he emphasized OneWeb's capability to deliver high-speed satellite internet, even in unconventional environments, owing to its proprietary satellite network. Addressing specific needs, Vetcher noted requests from Ukrainians' armed forces to uh, reliably uh, communicate in critical situations, citing instances where Starlink failed to meet their specific expectations. Uh, recent reports have highlighted challenges with Starlink's functionality in areas affected by electronic warfare activity, as experienced by Ukraposhta during shelling and also uh, power outages in Kharkiv. In March, Reuters revealed that Kyivstar's parent company, Vion, had struck a deal with OneWeb to integrate the latter's satellite services into its terrestrial network. OneWeb currently operates approximately 550 low-orbit satellites and plans to launch additional satellites in collaboration with SpaceX in the future. Vasil Maliuk, the head of Ukraine's security service, has revealed that there was a recent ploy by Russians to assassinate Oleksandr Pradukin, the head of the military administration in Kherson Oblast. Maliuk made this disclosure at Congress of the local regional, sorry, this is the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities, which is an event in Ukraine, uh, as reported uh, by uh, Zerlako Tijina. According to Maliuk, a local resident of Kherson, in collaboration with enemy secret services, attempted to orchestrate an assassination on Mr. Pradukin's life. The attempt involved uh, launching a new model of enemy FPV drone from a distance of 12 kilometers. The perpetrator conducted visual surveillance at the scene and directed fire towards uh, his vehicle. Fortunately, the plot was thwarted and the perpetrator was app apprehended after the attempt was completed. Additionally, the enemy drone was successfully neutralized by Ukrainian electronic warfare systems. Uh, Maliuk further mentioned that the security service has been investigating 12 similar incidents in Kherson 
involving planned attacks on military personnel, defense industry assets, and more. So that is the conclusion of all of my news for this week. So now we have uh, some, some very interesting information. So we're going to start, John, with your uh, recent update to your database on Russian missile strikes. So I'll turn it over to you to just uh, give the audience uh, an overview of what you've been tracking, and uh, we'll try to get that up on screen for you, John. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, so if we can go and get that up, that would help with my explanation. I'll get it up soon. So which tweet are you? Uh, is it the, the, the infographics? Yeah, yeah, just bring up the first one. Man, you tweet way too much. Yeah, do you need me to send you a link? Nah, I'll find it. It's, let me just send it to you, this is going to be faster. I thought you already had it. Erland, I just sent it in the chat. Okay, and I have it there. I have it. You want to start with the daily ones? Uh, sure. So um, I went ahead and as of what, is it, what, what was the date that I did this on? As of April 11th, so three days ago, uh, this reflects uh, Russian uh, missile and UAV raids against Ukraine from mid-August to uh, the past three days to April 11th. And you can gives you a pretty decent idea of what overall trends were. You can pretty see, uh, pretty clearly see the the big spikes from the Russian infrastructure campaign uh, in the winter of 2022 and, or excuse me, uh, uh, yeah, end of winter 2022, or, you know, beginning of 2023, then followed by the rather consistent daily uh, Shahed raids since about, you know, uh, May of uh, 2023 to uh, the present. Trends are overall fairly consistent, you know, um, relatively consistent variation raid size, heads basically every day, interspersed by uh, individual large cruise and ballistic missile raids. Um, so, you know, it's sort of just in keeping with prior trends, uh, the, the main sort of disclaimer here is that there is a lot of Russian ballistic missile employment, primarily S-300, S-400, that is not well reported. So, for example, I have data on 687 ballistic missiles being employed, you know, since August of 2022. The actual number is likely in excess of two to 3,000. I just don't have that data because nobody's reported it. So that's going to be a, a larger long-term project to, to work to kind of fill some of the significant gaps. There's also mass reporting gaps in the number of tactical missiles. So things like uh, KH-35, KH-31, uh, KH-59, et cetera, uh, that the Russians used to prosecute targets mainly fairly close to the front. And if you'll go to the uh, monthly slides. So again, you know, we can see this trend of there was a local peak around winter of 2022, beginning of 2023, uh, then sort of fell off, then it reached a new intensity in May of 2023, sort of maintained relative, you know, relative consistency, and has since begun to sort of steadily increase since then to the present. And if you can go to the next one. And so I, I think this is probably some some more interesting data is that, you know, complete, I mean, everybody knows this to some extent, but it's good to put numbers to it. There is an overwhelming trend towards Shahed employment, um, you know, whereas cruise missiles largely dominated, um, you know, throughout the first half of half of 2022, the Russians are now primarily reliant on the Shaheds as their primary uh, uh, standoff attack weapon and to, to a really overwhelming extent. And again, these numbers are somewhat warped by the fact that S-300, S-400, vastly underreported um you know they would make up a 
in reality, they make up a much, a much larger portion of this than the available data seems to indicate. And then this is just the overall uh, cumulative totals. Again, you know, Shahed's are by now a majority of the uh, standoff munitions that the Russians have employed since, you know, August of 2022. And that's only continuing to uh, to grow over time in a fairly linear manner. Real quick, can we full screen this? Um, and then, John, could you just explain the colors to people? I think you're, what you're illustrating here, this this exponential increase, that's clearly Shahed's. It's, it's, not um, ex it's not exponential. It's just linear. Well, sorry, yeah, but the the clear increase in acceleration of Shahed use, I think, is demonstrated by the graph. Yeah, uh, Erland, if you could make that full screen, please. Can you make the actual window full screen, your Chrome window? Uh, <laughs> might not be able to, but uh, oh, John, real quick, could you just explain what the colors mean to people just if they can't yeah. see? Sure. So blue is subsonic cruise missiles. So that's going to be your KH-555s, KH-101s, uh, KH-15s, uh, Caliber, and Iskander K. Uh, orange is uh, supersonic cruise missiles. So that's KH-22, KH-32, and um, Onyx, uh, 3M22. And then green is hypersonic cruise missiles. Uh, so that's Sircon. Uh, the Russians have employed a single digit number of those. Uh, red is ballistic missiles. So that's Iskander M, Kinjal, the North Korean stuff. So KN23, KN24, as well as uh, S300 uh, and S400. Purple is tactical missiles. So again, like I said earlier, that's the shorter range things such as KH-59, uh, KH-31, um, uh, KH-35, et cetera. And then finally, uh, brown or maroon, I should say, is the, the Shahed's, the one way attack UAVs. Got it. And it, I mean, this graph, as far as I can read, I think this is the one that's going to be the most comprehensible to people like me um, in terms of like what's going on. So, I mean, it's clear, as I said, the Shahed production is going up. It looks like the other missile production is going up very slightly. Is that, can we infer that from this or no? Yeah, it's gone up. I mean, if you, I, I think it's a little bit more readable from some of the other graphs, but it has definitely increased. Um, the Shahed production has just increased a lot faster. Gotcha. And is there anything else uh, you wanted to mention about uh, just your general database on this, John? Like any trends you've noticed or anything else you want to share about, uh, like you, you mentioned that there, there's going to be an, an effort that will be need to be undertaken to catalog more of the strikes in general, um, but anything else? Um, not really. I'm working on some uh, one or two other graphs that I think will be a little bit more interesting and have, I guess, some more insightful analysis regarding the efficacy of Ukrainian air defenses against some of these threats, but those are still a little bit of a work in progress. So maybe in a, in a future update. Got it. Well, John, I mean, we definitely appreciate you uh, taking the time to make these uh, really illustrative uh, graphical uh, displays of, of the current situation. Uh, so thanks so much for doing that. Uh, people are welcome to check out. We'll, we'll definitely include a link somewhere for people to check out the uh, infographics uh, that John made to explain all this. Um, so John has been a little busy, but uh, this week we have one person that has been very, very busy. Uh, and uh, he's had quite a week, and that, of course, is Colby. Uh, so Colby has published what I would argue are two articles. One is a Twitter thread, but it was 106 tweets long. So I think that qualifies as basically an article. Um, and then one was an article that uh, he wrote for The Insider. So we're going to start with his article for The Insider, uh, because it's about missiles. And I think that's a good uh, transition. Uh, and so we've also got John here if he wants to weigh in on anything. Uh, so uh, the uh, article that Colby published for The Insider uh, discusses Ukraine's strategic military challenges uh, particularly focusing on the disparity in long-range missile capabilities between the two countries. 
Uh, President Zelensky has consistently requested advanced long-range missile systems from Western allies, uh, specifically ATACMS, to effectively target strategic locations and counter Russian forces. Uh, despite receiving some support, uh, including Storm Shadow, Scalp EG cruise missiles, uh, sorry, Storm Shadow and Scalp EG cruise missiles from the UK and France, respectively, the US and Germany are still reluctant to supply longer range ATACMS and Taurus. Uh, this reluctance is largely due to concerns over Ukraine using the weapons to deep strike into Russian territory. So Colby's article details Russia's superior missile arsenal, which allows it to strike Ukrainian targets with a relatively high degree of freedom and uh, little risk of retaliation. And this capability gap uh, he's highlighted results in significant Ukrainian military and infrastructure losses. Uh, Russia's arsenal also includes a variety of missile systems that far outnumber and outperform Ukraine's, enabling the widespread and effective strikes uh, that we see. Ukraine has achieved notable strategic successes with missiles uh, with their limited resources, such as the sinking of the Russian warship Moskva. However, without comparable missile capabilities, Ukraine will struggle to effectively respond to Russian advances and protect its territory. Uh, the article argues that enhancing Russia's, sorry, enhancing Ukraine's missile capabilities could significantly alter the balance of power in the conflict. And Colby calls upon Western leaders to reconsider their stance on military support regarding uh, long-range weapons, suggesting that providing more advanced systems like ATACMS uh, would be critical for Ukraine to regain control over its territory. So Colby, uh, it's a, a great article. I couldn't couldn't agree more, my friend. Uh, is there anything uh, that I missed in my little uh, introductory summary of the article to people who didn't read it? Thanks, Joseph. I, I think that's uh, a pretty good overview. Um, it's there, it's not a it's not a complicated thesis at all, obviously. Um, and it's not even really my thesis. It's I, I'm just laying out what President Zelensky has been saying and what we've been hearing from uh, Ukrainian other Ukrainian officials and, and um, their military command since the beginning of the war, which is that long range strike is a very important capability for them to have. And uh, the my piece uh, draws upon John's excellent work, which he just uh, highlighted for all of us his his raid. Um, compilation raid data compilation which he's gotten from the ukrainian air force um and other uh, other trackers and as you can see from john's data that the russians have a very very large number of different missiles at their disposal uh lots of different types and obviously quite significant quantities you need all all fingers and all toes uh, just to count them all you can't you can't uh, you can't count them all on one hand. There's an awful lot of them. Whereas with Ukraine, you can count them on on one hand. Ukraine has very few limited options. They receive the Storm Shadow and Scalpy G from uh, the UK and France, obviously, and they have a you know a few uh, indigenous pr programs. They've got Neptune, which they've been able to field. Um, but aside from that, they don't have a whole lot at their disposal, which is a big problem when one side has very limited options, both in the different kinds of missiles that they have and the, the quantity available to them. And then Russia, who still has quite a deep inventory, uh, their production rates have increased since the beginning of the war, and they're being augmented by all these shaheds as well from Iran and now their own domestic licensed production. Um, and these are all very problematic things, and, and President Zelensky and um, other Ukrainian officials continue to make the case that they really need help um, from the United States and Germany and, and other countries to give them some of these capabilities uh, because they're not going to win without them. And I, I highlight in the article um, how successful Ukraine has been with just the very limited support that we have provided to them. They've done a, a lot of very impressive things with those storm shadows and those scalp EGs, particularly in Crimea and being able to deal some very significant blows to the, the Russian Black Sea fleet. And um, if Ukraine had had more missiles available to them, then um, I'm sure that they would be able to make quite skillful, further skillful use of those missiles. And uh, I think the way in which Ukraine has used the missiles they have been given so far shows that these concerns about escalation and how uh, Ukraine is going to use these missiles to um, attack certain targets in, in Russia that's going to provoke nuclear war. Um, I don't think that that's, uh, there, there's really no evidence to suggest that that would happen. The Ukrainians um, have gone out of their way to develop these long range strike drones to fill the role of um, striking targets within Russia, specifically because 
uh, it's been made quite clear that they are not uh, they are not permitted to use um, the Western donated long range missiles on Russian territory. So they they've just been using them against um, targets within their own occupied territory. So when you've got Olaf Scholz pontificating that oh Ukraine's going to send Mos- uh, missiles into Moscow and we can't have that because then Russia is going to escalate to nuclear war then. Um, I think it's just, there's no basis to that kind of thinking. So um, I just highlight the case that Ukraine um, is, has been very responsible and uh, we need to fulfill this this very needed capability. Um, because if we don't, then um, th- this disparity is only going to grow wider as stocks of um, available stocks of what we've been given to Ukraine so far dwindle and Russian production is increasing. So the problem's going to get worse, not better. Uh, and it's long overdue for us to change course and uh, start supplying with them with the long range strike capabilities that they need. Yeah, I think and the body of the article, I think, gets into some of the specific systems uh, that, you know, we would kind of fit into this category. Right. So um, you, you mentioned a few of them. Um, I think the one I didn't hear you mention, though, was uh, GLSDB. Did you you mention that in the article, right? Uh, yes. And GLSDB is. You know, it is longer range compared to Gimler's, for example, um, but it's still not really the kind of, um, it's not in the same ballpark as something like Storm Shadow or Attackums or Taurus. Like the range, the ranges we're speaking about are still quite disparate. Like GLSDB is a 150 kilometer range weapon. Um, so that's good, but it's not going to do the trick for targeting um, Crimea, for example. Um it can't it can't range very far into Crimea from where Ukrainian positions currently are. So there's an awful lot that it can't hit, and so far it seems like um, very limited numbers of those are, are available as well. We the reporting that we have is that there were um, a few dozen um, GLSDBs in the first shipment that Ukraine received, and we have seen it employed. Um, we do have evidence of of that. There's um, uh, debris uh, that's been the pictures of the debris that's been taken by the Russians and put on on uh, social media so that we know that it, it has been used. But um, as with anything, there needs to be a certain critical mass in terms of quantity for a weapon to have a significant impact, even if it's a very capable missile. If if the United States um, you know, finally gives Ukraine uh, full range, 300 kilometer range attack them, if it's just a few of them, then it's not going to have any impact. Um, Ukraine needs significant quantities of missiles. They need to be able to, they're, they're not going to be able to match what Russia uh, is able to generate in terms of their missile raids. If you refer back to John's um, John's graphs, like the Russians are, are just have a much deeper arsenal and they have um, pretty um, decent production rates. So Ukraine's not going to match Russia, but they need to be able to at least get closer in, the, in terms of the number of um, missile raids that they can generate. And the Ukrainians are being, as I said, much more judicious in the targets they're selecting. A, a lot of the Russian raids have continued to target Ukrainian civilian infrastructure, although I do know that there are some uh, issues and they have gotten better at both attacking more strategic targets uh, as well as more tactical operational em- employment of their missiles um, on the battlefield, attacking um, high value Ukrainian military targets. But Ukraine with limited stocks has been able to achieve pretty good effects. So if we gave them a lot more, that would just be able to increase the the number and the variety of Russian high value targets that they would be able to prosecute. Yeah, I think you you give a couple other examples of that. Um, you know, like Ukrainian Ukrainians using long range weapon systems, uh, like you know their own indigenous like Tochka U and uh, a few others. Um, are there any other specific weapon systems from the article that you wanted to uh, reference uh, or uh, no? Uh, no, well, I mean, uh, I, I, one thing I think I didn't actually um, mention was Slam ER. I don't think I actually mentioned that one. Um, so that would be another missile that um, certainly we need to see Ukraine receive because of the issue with um, Storm Shadow and Scalp EG. We don't have any um, firm confirmation as of yet that there is a um, there are new orders being placed for Ukraine by Britain or France. There's been some um, some comments about that, that that may be happening, but that's not something that is publicly verified yet to the best of my knowledge. 
Um, so if there's no, if there's going to be no more missiles coming on an ongoing basis, new, newly produced missiles rather than just missiles that are in stock being provided to Ukraine, then Ukraine is going to run out of of these um, cruise missiles. And Fabian, our friend Fabian, has um, has done uh, a number of graphs modeling um, what that might look like in terms of how many missiles Ukraine has received and what their expenditure rates are and when they might be expected to run out of those missiles. Um, so they will run out at some point in time, so long as there's no new production. So it's very important for Ukraine to receive missiles that can be produced on an ongoing basis so that they don't have this problem of they're going to run out eventually. So attack them, though very important, Ukraine needs them, are finite because the United States um, is not going to be procuring additional attack for themselves. They are trying to transition to precision strike missile. So... Ukraine can receive attackums out of U.S. inventory, but they wouldn't likely be receiving any additional attackums, even uh, assuming that they, you know, President Biden agrees to give them at some point in time. Um, just in terms of what the capacity is, it's not an ongoing solution. But Slam ER, on the other hand, the U.S. has fairly significant stocks of that missile, and it's a missile that is not really um, in frontline service with the U.S. Navy so much anymore, and there is an active production line for it as well which is just producing for one foreign military sales customer, which is Saudi Arabia. So it'd be very easy to place orders for SLAM ER for Ukraine and produce it on an ongoing basis for them. And that would give them, that would ensure that they don't lose that air launch cruise missile capability, um, which is an important capability for them to have. Um, so that's one thing that I, I don't think I did mention in the article. So I would make that addition to one of the other tools in the toolbox, in addition to Attackens, in addition to Taurus, and potentially as well if the UK or France are able to um, place new orders and ensure that those um, those missile production lines are, are turning out missiles on an ongoing basis for Ukraine. Um, those are the key systems on our part that I think we need to deliver to them uh, to try and even the balance a little bit vis-a-vis uh, -vis what the Russians are able to, um, to generate. John, anything you want to add uh, in terms of specific systems that might help with the, this uh, larger problem? Uh, just to, to briefly add a little bit of context to, to SLAM ER, the, my understanding anyways, um, from some uh, U.S. Navy um, uh, Super Hornet pilots is that as a matter of practice, they do not plan, they do not train to employ and they do not plan to employ SLAM ER for reasons that i am uh, not legally permitted to know um so you know obviously in a crisis that may change but as it currently stands we seem to be ending our requirement for having those in stock and we should have somewhere between 600 and 700 of them uh in u.s navy inventory that um we'll either not need to demilitarize or find others you know some other in state for them over the next few years um so it comes to my mind that um, you didn't talk about NSM. Um, am I right? Didn't talk about what, sorry? NSM, Naval Strike Missile. Uh, no, I didn't mention Naval Strike Missile, although that, that is another missile that there has been some conversation about uh, whether that could be provided to Ukraine. Um, there, were some, there was some reporting about Poland kind of musing about maybe providing NSM to Ukraine. Um, so certainly that's another possible candidate, although I would say that um, NSM is less important compared to some of the other ones because Ukraine already has um, some capabilities in that domain. They have the, their own indigenous um, Typhoon missile. They have some Harpoon missiles as well already. Um, so I mean, I'm sure they would not turn turn away an offer for a naval strike missile. And as I, John or yourself can correct me if I'm wrong, I think there is a limited uh, secondary surface to surface strike against land targets capability there, but it's been validated. Um, yes. Yeah. So, but I don't think in terms of range, I think it's, we're still talking about uh, significantly less than an air launch cruise missile. Um, I, what is it? Is it under 200 kilometers? I, I, do they um, they validate what the maximum range is against the? It the depends. Surface? It depends entirely on the flight profile. It's um, I want to say once like 300 something kilometers in a high high low configuration. If you do low altitude the whole way, that's probably going to cut it in half. So it's mission dependent. 
right? So, I mean, theoretically, 300 kilometers, but uh, as you say, if they're flying high, high, low, then that's a much easier trajectory for Russian air defense to intercept. Um, so you have to think about what your your PK is, I guess, and how many missiles you're going to need to assign per target to to have a reasonable probability of, of having impacts um, with that kind of trajectory. And then if you're flying low, then we're kind of back to the point where uh, it doesn't have range really to reach much further than Ukraine is already reaching with other systems. So um, certainly, again, Ukraine won't turn, I don't think it's going to turn up anything, but I, I wouldn't put it in the category of a weapon that's going to have a decisive impact, um, especially because I don't, I wouldn't anticipate that a huge number of them would be provided um, just because the production rates are not super high. And there are lots of other customers who are looking for it um, for their to use it um, on their own warships and in coastal batteries as well. So I don't know how much slack capacity there is there um, in terms of ongoing sustainment. So we'd just be looking at what donor countries would be willing to provide Ukraine with. So um, that's, uh, that's why it wasn't mentioned. Yeah, I, I, I presume that they would have to, like, some customers would have to give up their slots for Ukraine to get them in relatively uh, useful time. But, you know, it, it's it's not impossible. Um, uh, the interesting thing is that it is also possible to air launch it. It's not the main um, launch platform, of course, but there is an air launch uh, version for it as well, which is not the JSM, but... An, a normal NSM air launched or variant. Um, I have no idea what what the capabilities of that is going, you know, compared to range of the, the, the ground launch or sea launch one. But yeah, also the problem of the warhead, which is you know not not in the same range as uh, the other cruise missiles. It's it's a different capability and it's not meant for ground uh, targets, but. If they could get them um, uh, for the F-16s, prob probably would be a nice addition. So as far as I sort of took away from the article, right, I mean, this is a uh, dimension of the war or a theater of the war where uh, there's a clear imbalance. Uh, Russia has, you know, a lot of strategic options here and Ukraine kind of doesn't. Um, obviously, people have recognized the need for like Ukrainian air defense systems um, to address this problem, but that's really, I think, not addressing the root of the issue, which is that defense systems don't really allow you to strike back, uh, which is needed uh, for uh, you know to, to prosecute a war successfully. So, um, you know, I think that the Western partners that Ukraine has have been a little bit reticent either to provide them for political reasons or because the scale that would be required is just, you know, vast enough that they're not able or willing to hand them out in quantity. Um, so this is something that uh, is a very clear strategic problem that's bigger than I think just Ukraine for these countries. They need to take missile production more seriously. And I would say in the immediate term, they need to uh, get over these weird strategic concerns they have and provide Ukraine with like long range strike capability. Um, Colby, is that like, I'd say the gist of your article? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Um, this is, there's, there's a lot of fundamental misunderstanding about what air and missile defense is about, what it can do, what the purpose is. Um, and the approach that we're kind of taking right now is just not economically sustainable and it's not an actual solution to Ukraine's problem. So like we need to provide Ukraine air defense so that it can survive and protect critical infrastructure uh, to enable them to strike back. But that's the part, that's the part where we're, we're falling short here is the strike back part, because it's not possible for us to equip Ukraine with enough air defenses to where they can just have a impenetrable shield and definitely against Russia's production. Russia can just produce more, uh, they can generate more raids with a combination of the Shaheds and the and missiles of, of all these diff different varieties than we can produce and deliver air, de air defense interceptors to them. Um, so Ukraine just can't play catch indefinitely here. Eventually, they're going to run out. Even if we were giving Ukraine 100% of our production for everything, they would still run out because Russia is just going to be able to generate more. Um, 
so that Ukraine will be overwhelmed eventually. So Ukraine has to have some capacity to strike back at Russia and harm Russia's strategic industries. They have to be able to try and prosecute Russia's um, launch units for all these different missiles. They have to be able to prosecute Russian uh, air bases that, that are within range. Um, and they're not going to be able to hit everything. Russia has a lot of air bases. Russia is a big country. They have strategic depth. So there's not really a lot that can be done about their strategic bomber fleet. But if they can just keep tactical aviation, keep fighter jets um, further away from the front line, that will have a, a very significant impact. Um, because as I noted in a previous column for the Insider, the Russians have really adapted and, and are making very... Um, very impactful use of these glide bombs now, which are being launched by their fighter aircraft. And those are having a very, very significant impact on Ukrainian forces on the front line. Um, so the ability of Ukraine to try and deny air bases to Russia that are closer to the front line is very important. Um, so it's, it's quite essential that we not only provide them with air defense interceptors, but give them the ability to strike back because air defense interceptors don't actually solve any, any problem in the long term. They're just a short term respite that need to be followed up with us equipping Ukraine to take the fight back to Russia. Because if Ukraine is just on the defensive going forward, um, then they will eventually just lose. Um, they need to be able to retaliate in kind to, against Russia. John, any uh, final thoughts on Colby's article? Uh, I don't really have anything to add. He covered most everything. Great. So, uh, Colby, I'll leave it up to you. Do you want to take Q&A for uh, the missile stuff, uh, or divide it up, or do you want to just get right into your uh, thread as well? Um, I, if there's any particular questions on this topic that people uh, have right now, then I can, we can take a few, but otherwise we could um, just move on. Sounds like Germanade's to Ukraine's favorite question right there. So, yeah. Uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, so I found this question from Possum Nation. Uh, sorry, but wouldn't there be an is issue similar to why Germany isn't supplying the Taurus? Uh, if our long-range weapons require U.S. military in Ukraine, it would effectively allow Russia to have Kasus Belli. Um, so I guess... Well <laughs> uh i think i think i under sorry go ahead joseph i was gonna say maybe to restate it as a question like jeopardy um would putting these long-range strike capabilities in ukraine require personnel from those countries on the ground colby uh no it would not yeah this is a lie that has been stated repeatedly by german chancellor Scholz. it is not true at all um, it's not true for Taurus. It's certainly not true for anything that the United States would provide. Uh, the United States has already provided HIMARS to Ukraine. Ukraine is using HIMARS to fire uh, Gimlers. They have used HIMARS to fire the oldest M39 Block 1 attackums with only 165 kilometer range. So um, they can give Ukraine a Block uh, 1A, an M39A1 attack them to 300 kilometers range they can give them an m48 or an m57 attack them to 300 kilometer range and ukraine can use it immediately ukraine is already using storm shadow and scalp eg um, on their legacy soviet fighter jets um so and it, there's no there's no british or french soldiers that are on there in, in ukraine doing that work for ukraine the ukrainians are just doing that themselves they've been trained there may be um, outside technical support, but it's not anything that is requiring Western soldiers uh, to go into Ukraine and, and do this for the Ukrainians. Um, so Taurus is no different. Our friend Fabian, again, has written extensively about this. It is not required for German soldiers or any other country soldiers to go into Ukraine to operate any of these systems on Ukraine's, Ukraine's behalf. The training can be done in Poland or elsewhere, uh, and Ukraine can operate uh, these systems with remote technical assistance um, uh, if if necessary. Um, but it, it's not going to require a deployment into Ukrainian territory. It's just not true. Um, maybe can I add something to that? Yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, I just want to highlight that um, you're absolutely right. It's not technically uh, necessary to have German soldiers in Ukraine to operate Taurus. Um, but I want to point out that the way Scholz says a delivery to Ukraine is okay, 
would be with German soldiers because he doesn't trust Ukraine and thinks that um, German soldiers need to supervise the um, deployment of Taurus, right? So in his way of thinking, it's not a lie. Just want to point that out. But you're absolutely right in saying it's not technically necessary. I mean, Spain operates Taurus, South Korea operates Taurus, and there are no German soldiers, right? So Ukraine is no difference. But I just want, wanted to highlight that that he doesn't trust Ukraine and he uh, basically wants or would need German soldiers to supervise the targeting so uh, Ukraine doesn't strike in Russian soil. Um, and therefore, he needs German soldiers. Um, yeah, just wanna, wanted to add that. Sorry. Yeah, thanks. And as I said earlier, this is kind of the fundamental problem that Chancellor Scholz believes that there is some great risk of of um, nuclear war with with Russia, if if uh, Taurus is delivered, the Ukrainians are just going to strike Moscow with it, um, and there, certainly this thinking uh, is pervasive in the United States as well in in uh, in the National Security Council um, that this is an unacceptable risk that that this is this view has already been conclusively disproven by the way Ukraine has used Storm Shadow and Scalpy G missiles. Um, so I, it's astounding that people still hold these beliefs and they're, they are taken at all seriously um, when they espouse those views. Yeah, there's also another question from Robin. Um, why do you think the energy campaign has been more successful this, win this winter than last? Um, the percentages of shootdown seems similar. I would punt that one to John. He's probably the best place to answer that question. Uh, could you repeat the question? Why do you think the energy campaign has been more successful this winter than, uh, to, with respect to the last? Uh, the percentages of shootdown seem similar. Wait, the, the mean, question. So I understand now. It, it hasn't, though. Um, there's not... Roll, massive rolling blackouts across Ukraine. So I'm not sure um, the premise that it's more successful this time around than last time is necessarily correct. Yeah, I think maybe th there's been um, certain success in certain areas, uh, but yeah, um, doesn't look like uh, there's blackouts rolling all over Ukraine. Uh, so not sure if the, the perception of, of what you perceived through the media is is probably the reason i'm not sure but yeah i'll, I'll just add real quick you know i i do the, the news reports and and uh just the various things i've picked up doing that like uh so the ukrainian government has certainly reported you know the strikes are quite significant for example there are certain like um thermal power plants that have been hit that just they're just not coming back right um so they're they're talking about a lot of different things right they want to like decentralize the power structure. So they, they don't want to build big power plants anymore. They want to make sure that it's all dispersed across the country. Um, they're talking about having companies like generate their own electricity, you know, on the roof of their building or whatever to like help mitigate the problem um, and so forth. Um, so they're, they're taking a very active stance. They've said that um, the, the situation, they don't predict the situation to be as bad as last year. I think basically they've been preparing, you know, for this whole time. Um, and, you know, there certainly are, um, there are situations where they're cutting power to preserve, to save electricity, but they've been working also to integrate the um, electric uh, grid, as I mentioned in the news report, to Europe, so they're able to import electricity. And then another thing worth mentioning is like the Ukrainian economy is actually doing better this year than it was last year. Um, and so that does mean they're going to use more electricity, like that's just, you know, demand is higher than it was last year. So. Um, so far, I would say it seems like the power grid has been like definitely hit hard. Um, and there are certain things that are happening to it that can't be easily dealt with. Um, but, you know, Ukraine has uh, at least ideas about how to address the problem. And at least so far, I think they've demonstrated that they've been making preparations. And while they're, they're having an, the attacks are having an effect, they're not going to have the same like like John was saying, like a system wide grid failure that we saw um last year um yeah
Yeah, I think that was it for uh, questions for, for this uh, topic. Okay, so uh, up next, we have Colby's uh, absolutely gigantic uh, mega thread about presidential drawdown authority. So I'll provide just a brief summary to those of you. We, we put all the links, I believe, in the, in the chat and so forth. So you're, you're more than welcome. I would implore everyone to go read all this stuff um, you know, direct from the source. Uh, but uh, I'll try to do my best to provide a, a sort of a summary. So presidential drawdown authority is a provision of U.S. code that allows the U.S. president to authorize the emergency transfer of defense articles and services from U.S. stocks to foreign countries. This authority is primarily defined under Section 506 of the Foreign Assistance Act, and it stipulates that in emergency situations, Defense articles can be sent to foreign allies without the need for a lengthy legislative process, provided that the transfers do not exceed $100 million in value per fiscal year for all beneficiaries combined, unless specified uh, otherwise by Congress. For Ukraine, Congress specified an increase in the cap on the value of articles that could be transferred under PDA uh, due to the acute military needs arising from the full-scale invasion by Russia. The cumulative cap for fiscal year 2022 and 2023 was raised to a total of 25.5 billion, and this allowed for rapid and substantial U.S. military support. PDA is intended to be used swiftly to address urgent foreign policy or national security concerns by providing military aid directly from U.S. Department of Defense stocks. This is different from other funding mechanisms that usually involve purchasing equipment from industry, which can be slower to implement. Uh, Colby's article, or you know, his thread, uh, highlights the necessity of notifying Congress about drawdowns, a step integral to the legality of these actions under U.S. law, and uh, he critiques the administration's interpretation of these legal requirements, suggesting potential oversteps in executive authority. Uh, and we'll get into like the specifics of that. Uh, while significant funds have been allocated for replacing the defense articles sent to Ukraine, there's a mismatch between drawdowns and actual replacement funds needed. Uh, the shortfall risks U.S. military readiness being uh, depleted and uh, there no, no timely replenishment as a result. Uh, the text critiques the U.S. administration's handling of military aid, suggesting indecision and inadequate strategic planning have hindered effective support for Ukraine. And uh, I would say Colby calls for a clearer and more consistent policy that aligns drawdowns with actual funding and strategic objectives. Uh, and uh, there's a recommendation, I would say, that adjustments to funding uh, allocations to ensure adequate replacement of provided military equipment, uh, and there should be an increased PDA cap alongside a proportional increase in replacement funding to avoid uh, future disruptions. In other words, right now the administration's byline seems to be that for every dollar we send in PDA to Ukraine, we only need one dollar of replacement funding. The problem there is that it's going to take more to replace these outdated, like, the way that we're valuing the, these things that we're sending to Ukraine, we're not going to be able to replace them in the same quantity with dollar for dollar, right? We would need more dollars to replace them. So that, I think that's what the the it, the main logical issue that Colby's pointing to. But there have been a few others. Um, so Colby, maybe let's just start there. Like, I mean, I think overall, you're um, generally like you you feel if if I understood based on my reading, like you're you're positive about PDA as a tool, um, and but you would say it's kind of a very specific instrument. And currently, the administration doesn't appear to have like a clear plan or understanding of how to implement it. And I've noticed this too in some of their exchanges with um, you know answering questions about it. There, they seem to be operating under certain assumptions that aren't shared by everyone. And so I think we'll maybe try to get into the specifics of like what what you mean by that, right? So so when you say, for example, if, if I characterize this dollar for dollar issue specifically, and then the other issue is um, there's certain um, like legal uh, issues that uh, the administration has, has been involved with um, that have caused some questions uh, that could be, I guess, like more clearly stated in terms of like what their legal authority is or their executive authority in terms of acting. So could you maybe like go into those specifics and we'll start there? Um, sure. So on the on the overvaluation uh, incident that happened, with that, like it, you know, it makes 
sense what the problem was. Like they've explained it, like what happened. And I don't, I personally don't view there as being anything underhanded or untoward there. I think it's just basically incompetence. People didn't understand how to do their jobs properly. They didn't understand what the financial management management regulation said so that they made this mistake where when they were told, Hey, what's the value of all this equipment that we're going to send to Ukraine? They gave the wrong number. Uh, whereas they're, they're supposed to give the actual net book value of these assets in a number of different cases, they used what the replacement cost was going to be instead. So that led to the overvaluation of the asset. So instead of saying, Hey, this old artillery shell is worth, uh, $200. They said, Oh, this old artillery shelf shell is actually like a thousand dollars. Cause that's what it's going to cost to replace it. So that happened in, um, in some cases, uh, not necessarily with artillery shells, but for a number of different systems, uh, in a number of different cases that happened. So that inflates the value of what was actually provided to Ukraine. Um, and they discovered the problem eventually, and they ensured that everybody was doing things, doing things correctly. But that whole incident has caused, uh, a bit of a crisis of, of confidence, um, in the administration. And a lot of people just don't understand like why this happened. There, there's still a lot, a lot of misconceptions around what happened. Um, and that's certainly been not good for their case of supporting Ukraine because, um, whether it's people are, uh, actually still don't understand, or they're just using it, uh, as an excuse to not support Ukraine, which is certainly a factor at play as well. People are pointing to this saying, see, they, they've got no idea what they're doing. They're making up numbers. Um, why are we helping Ukraine when the administration can't even do things properly? Um, so that's been unhelpful that they made this big mistake. Um, but uh, around the, the legal question specifically, so when this happened and they said, okay, there's uh, 6.2 billion worth of defense articles were, were overvalued or, or defense articles were overvalued up to $6.2 billion. Um, so the, the amount of uh, drawdown authority that was utilized was actually uh, $6.2 billion less. And they said, well, uh, basically, we've already told Congress that we're going to execute drawdowns of $6.2 billion in all the previous uh, notifications we've sent to Congress. So Congress already knows that we're going to send $6.2 billion worth of equipment to Ukraine. So because we already told Congress, we don't need to tell them again in a new notification that we can um, continue to, to draw down things up to that value. And it is legal to once you've notified Congress to execute those drawdowns over fiscal years, because although the statute says that you can only draw down up to $100 million per year, unless Congress increases increases it, which, it, which they did, um, but that's still a yearly cap and it doesn't roll over into the next fiscal year. But once you've notified the drawdown, then the execution can roll over. So before the end of the fiscal year, if you tell Congress we're going to execute this drawdown, whatever the amount, uh, whatever amount of money it's worth, you can keep executing that drawdown um, into the next fiscal year uh, and beyond. Yeah, so you don't have to deliver the defense articles the next day after you make that announcement. Although in some cases uh, that has actually happened and in some cases, They've made an announcement and they had the stock pre-positioned in Poland, ready to go. And then things started entering Ukraine within hours of those notifications going to Congress. Uh, but in other cases, it might take weeks where they announce that they're going to deliver something from U.S. stock. But it's something that's um, deep inside the U.S. and they hadn't done any, um, they hadn't moved the assets at all. And it's something that wasn't really air transportable. So they had to ship it to the coast and then. Um, have it go over to Europe on boats. So that is something that's happened as well. It depends on what the defense article is. So the drawdown execution can take a long time sometimes. Um, but the, the point is that even though that that's all legal, the, the issue here, and I know it's it's kind of complicated and nuanced, um, the, 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 the part that is legally suspect in, 
in my estimation and not just my estimation because the Department of Defense Inspector General is actually actively investigating the administration's handling of this situation. Uh, and they do have a report that is due at some point this year. Um, I think it's supposed to come out by this summer, if I recall correctly. Um, they're investigating this and they may come out and say that uh, actually it's pretty legally dubious that the administration believed that Congress had already been told about this $6.2 billion and therefore they can just keep executing drawdowns um, off of that amount. My position when we discovered the problem was that the administration should just write a new notification to Congress saying, yeah, we're going to execute $6.2 billion worth of drawdowns to Ukraine. And, and then they would be on very firm legal ground to continue these drawdowns as they have been. Um, they've been drawing on that $6.2 billion worth of authority since uh, August. But the fact that they didn't issue a new notification to Congress is kind of uh, sh shaky legal ground. Um, and I, I think the DOG IG will probably um, come to that same conclusion. Um, so that that's, um, that's that issue. Um, your other question was about the replacement. So yeah, um, coming back to the, the valuation, everything has to be valued at uh, at its net book value, which is going to, which is the original acquisition cost minus depreciation, which is just a percentage, basically. Um, and the percentage depends on just the condition of the defense article, how old it is, um, whether it's uh, still in, been well maintained or whether it's in bad condition. That'll determine what percent of original acquisition cost you're using to determine the, the net, net book value. So if you have something that's pretty old, but it's still usable and they're going to draw that to Ukraine, the thing that you might want to buy to replace it is obviously going to be a lot more expensive. So the administration, they claimed that um, they assumed that buying a replacement defense article would require a 10% premium um, in replacement funds. So if you drew down something to Ukraine, versus, which is worth $1, that it would cost a dollar and ten cents to buy the replacement defense article, which you don't have to know anything about anything in the military sphere or defense procurement. Just logically, I think everybody can understand that something that's really, really old and depreciated in value is probably, um, you know, if you want to replace that, it's probably not going to cost uh, a ten percent premium on on that value, right? Like if you have an old car and you wanna buy a brand new car, is your brand new car going to cost 10% more than your old car? Probably not. It's probably gonna cost a lot more than that. Uh, but the administration said, well, we thought it would just be 10%. So I, I don't understand at all how they could have come to that conclusion. Um, even without not having a comparable situation in which they had to deliver huge amounts of um, equipment to a foreign country through drawdown authority. This is kind of a new thing in American history. Actually, it's not. Last time it happened was during Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam War really um, was the last time that super, uh, very extensive use was made of, of PVA on this scale, at least. Um, it's a tool that's been used uh, lots in the past. But in terms of scale, uh, the Vietnam War was probably the last time that they made significant use of, of Section uh, 506. So there wasn't a lot of institutional knowledge to draw on here, but um, 10%, a 10% premium, just, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, just think about the car example. Like that's very intuitive and easy to understand. And that should translate pretty easily, lo easily logically into what is it going to cost to replace all these defense articles? So they said, oh, well, we thought it would be 10%. And now they're saying that, oh, well, we actually realized it's a 20% premium. That if something, you give something to Ukraine worth worth a dollar, the replacement article is going to cost a dollar and 20 cents. And yet, when we look at the data, their data, uh, all their their numbers, all their budget documentation, it clearly shows that in order to replace all these defense articles in order to cover all the other costs that this fund, this pool of money um, needs to cover, we're talking about an 80% to a 100% premium is what it's going to cost to actually replace everything and cover all the other expenses involved in executing drawdowns and providing um, support to Ukraine. So they said 10%. Now they said 20%. It's actually 80 to 100%. 
And in their budget requests that they're submitting to Congress, they're not even asking for this 20%. So there's just a complete mismatch in the numbers here um, that the Department of Defense is, uh, well, not even the Department of Defense. There's a mismatch between the, there's a mismatch between the numbers between what the Department of Defense is saying and then what's actually being done by the DOD and by the Office of Management and Budget. And the question is like, is this because everybody at DOD is incompetent and they don't understand their own numbers or are they giving an accurate assessment of their requirements to the Office of Management and Budget and the National Security Council and then being overruled? And I don't have an answer to that question because it's kind of unknowable. So I leave it to people to make their own conclusions about um, what what's happening there um because i i don't know i i struggle i struggle to to think that the pentagon could be this inept um but but who knows um there are certainly um a lot of people who are clearly very mediocre um that is specifically in the office of um undersecretary of defense for policy office um who that's the office that has primary responsibility for coordinating all the Ukraine aid. Um, and uh, the former um, occupant of that office is, is something, somebody with that was clearly very bad at his job. Um, and so it, it's, it, I suppose it is plausible that they, they were just that clueless. Um, but there's a number of different possible explanations for why this happened. And we don't have clarity on that. Yeah, so I think to summarize, right, there are obviously like legal hurdles uh, to getting like aid to Ukraine. Um, but this is like as far as what the executive authority can do. I think there's like some pretty simple things that they could do to improve the, I guess, like transparency and legality of their actions. Um, and I think it, like you mentioned, right, notifying Congress is one example, right? Like it doesn't really cost them anything to do that. Um, or also to uh, price this stuff into their requests and things like that. Um, so this is just, I think, a, a couple examples. But I think it's culminated in, you know, this week, uh, kind of a, a recent thing which happened, which is the um, this. So here's my general understanding of the situation. You can, of course, correct it, right? Um, the administration's been saying since the very beginning of the year, like, there's nothing left for Ukraine. We don't, there's nothing. Um, then sort of, $300 million was discussed. And uh, after that, uh, there has been about $300 million that has gone to Ukraine. And I think as far as I understand, your contention here is that, like, obviously nothing has changed in the budgetary situation. Like, no new money has been found or created. Um, but this is more a result of, like, the administration sort of changing their ideas about how to do things. Um, so I think it's a good example here of where the administration could be more clear in terms of how they're um, messaging about like the current situation and also where they could have better communication with like other branches of like government in terms of like how how this stuff is used. And and uh, so, yeah, is that uh, if, if you want to talk about this more recent situation that's been going on? Well, the the recent drawdown that they made in in March, which I highlighted at, at the very beginning of the thread, um, they're maintaining the same position that they have been, which is the consistently wrong position. So their position is that, well, we can't deliver any drawdowns to Ukraine unless we have uh, replacement funding available as well to buy new stuff to replace what we're gonna give to Ukraine, right? That's all logical, we all understand the need to replace um, the defense articles that are being provided to Ukraine. But again, the problem comes into um, how they are accounting for what the replacement costs are uh, and whether there was actually money available in the first place. So this 300 million drawdown package that just was announced, that's being quote unquote backed by the fact that um, they had a return of around $300 million from contracts that came in under budget. So when they, um, when they notify Congress that they're going to spend these replacement dollars that they have appropriated to them by Congress to buy, um, to buy things that, uh, to replace the defense articles, 
send a notification to Congress saying, hey, we're going to spend this amount of money to buy this. Like, we're going to spend $100 million to buy artillery shells. And then Congress says, okay, yes, go buy $100 million worth of artillery shells. And when you actually go to negotiate the contract with the company that's going to build those artillery shells, it might come in under budget. So it might be, oh, well, we thought we were going to need to spend $100 million, but actually it's only going to be $90 million. Uh, and this has happened. There have been six, prior to this one, there were six previous um, tra quote unquote transfer returns where you've got a bunch of contracts that came in under budget. And so all of that money uh, that was saved because the contract negotiations came in under budget that goes back into the replacement fund so that they can use those dollars for something else. So again, the administration has not done a good job of explaining this, but that's like totally normal. Um, it's a normal process that happens just like outside of the Ukraine contracting, like the duty signs contracts all the time uh, on their own behalf to buy things um, and things might come in under budget than what they originally expected they would need to spend. So there's nothing, again, underhanded about that. So that's where this money came from, where all of a sudden they say, oh, yeah, we're going to give another 300 million drawdown to Ukraine. And the reason they're doing that is because they had around 300 million dollars in funds come back from um, contract negotiations that came in under the forecasted budget. The problem is, is that and again, all of this is explained in depth in the thread is um, the administration has been quote unquote, out of like out of money uh, for probably about a year now where, yes, they had they had some replacement funds in the bank that hadn't been committed and hadn't been spent yet. But the assessed requirements, replacement requirements that they had already determined. So they had already done calculations to figure out how much is it going to cost to buy all this replacement stuff. Back in July, they told Congress that that number um, was already $5 billion over the total amount of replacement funding that Congress had appropriated. So Congress had already appropriated $25 billion, and they had assessed that they had over $30 billion in uh, assessed replacement costs. So they were already out of money before July of last year but only recently have they been saying oh well we're out of money we don't have any money left to buy replacement stock and we we can't give anything more to ukraine because if we did then that would hurt our readiness because we don't have any money but they've been out of money for over a year now so there's actually been no change over the past year but only recently have they decided to say oh well ukraine's not going to get anything more from us because uh, we don't have any more money left and Congress needs to appropriate more money for us to buy the replacement stock. And if they don't, then it causes a readiness impact. But th the readiness impact doesn't come from the fact that there's no replacement dollars. The readiness impact comes from the fact that there are defense articles that are leaving U.S. stock. That happens immediately. Um, unless we're talking about things that are just not at all needed by the DOD in any way, shape or form, uh, in which case that should probably be an EDA transfer. But for other stuff that the DOD does have like a need for, like the, if the if the U.S. Army gives a Pac-3 MSE interceptor, the U.S. needs those for themselves as well. But they're making a decision that well, we're, we'll give some to Ukraine. So as soon as that missile leaves U.S. inventory, there's a reduction in the amount of readiness that you have because it's something that you need for your own requirements. Even if you think you have a little bit of extra, you know, operational needs can change very quickly, as we're seeing in the Middle East right now. Um, things can go sideways and suddenly you're going to need a lot more of something than you might have thought. So that readiness impact happens immediately as soon as the thing leaves U.S. inventory. And whether you have money to buy it or not, that readiness impact will remain until it's replaced. And the biggest delay in getting that replacement article is the contracting process and just the production process of how long it takes to, to build it and what the lead time is um for due to the backlog of missiles that are already on order so their whole argument about the absence of additional funding um being a readiness impact is just not true um and of course this is all created by them in the first place because they just didn't ask for enough money they're out of money because they didn't ask for enough money they never told congress they never 
gave an honest and accurate assessment to Congress. Even though they said that they were, they never told them how much money it would actually take to buy all this replacement stock that they need. Um, so it's it's when Congress has already passed four bills, um, four supplemental bills to appropriate replacement funding and everything else, at no point was Congress ever told the truth about how much this would cost. And obviously Congress needs to pass another bill and they should pass a really, really big bill, a lot more than is currently being asked for, because as I calculate and do all the math, the amount that they're asking for now isn't even close to covering what the requirements are. Um, even to cover what, even to cover the amount of drawdown authority in their bill, it doesn't do that. And it certainly doesn't cover Ukraine's requirements. The amount of authority and the amount of funding in the bill uh, is like basically keeping Ukraine on life support. It will not allow them to um, really match Russia. Going back to our previous conversation, Ukraine has a lot of needs for a lot of different systems, and those needs cannot be met by what is currently on the table here. It just, it's way short of what the actual requirements are for them to have a fighting chance at um, actually recapturing any of their territory. Yeah, so hopefully you laid out the case, right? I think a lot of it's very procedural, but I think the point is that the executive branch has the authority to do all this stuff. It's just they have a very clearly defined authority in those capacities that they have it, and they have a, a it's necessary for them to work with Congress to get all this stuff done, um, even though it is like a, a, a mechanism by which, you know, the president's able to sort of bypass the normal legislative procedures, right? So um, I think it sort of behooves them going forward uh, in general to like take a more uh, thoughtful approach to how this is implemented. And uh, they should, I, I think like the, the general point is like, request more money to replace stuff because this is important. Like th this stuff does need to be replaced and it's, it's going to cost money. And uh, if we're, if our budgetary requirements keep falling short, then we're not going to be able to replace it in a meaningful time frame. And uh, we need to, we need, we need more stuff because uh, the world is becoming a more dangerous place. So uh, I don't know, is that, is that maybe a good way to sum it up or simplify it, Colby? I'm trying to like tie it all together. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the United States military uh, has a lot of global demands on it. There's a lot of um, theaters of operation where they need to ensure that they have adequate forces um, around the world. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis being placed on having um, sufficient forces in Indo-Pacific Command to meet the growing threat posed by China and North Korea. Uh, so a lot of people in the United States, particularly in Congress, are very focused on that. And there's not even enough resources uh, for that primary challenge that's been identified. And then you have to talk about the necessity of continuing to support Ukraine, which is essential in all of our view. Uh, and it has a direct relation to um, the willingness of, of China and other bad actors to take more aggressive steps if they see that the United States is not willing to support Ukraine. Why would they assume that the United States would support Taiwan or J Japan or South Korea or anybody else? And then you look at what's happening in the Middle East, and there's just a lot of stress, a lot of demand being placed on the United States military to um, have presence and have capabilities deployed. Uh, and the defense budget just doesn't have enough um, doesn't have enough resources to meet those demands. So it's very important that uh, there's sufficient funding to meet those challenges, sufficient funding to just replace things that are being given to Ukraine. Um, because if there isn't sufficient funding, then down the road, um, when you know these capabilities should be should be delivered to the United States military, they won't because there wasn't money to place the orders in the first place. So um, if the funding is there, then um, the, that funding can be invested into the defense industrial base to increase production capacity. It can be used to place the orders for all the munitions that need to be ordered to replace for Ukraine and just to buy new things that um, aren't necessarily for replacing stuff that's sent to Ukraine just to buy, um, buy build up larger stockpiles of key munitions. And that's all been happening over the per past two years, which is really good, but it's still far kind of below the scale that it needs to happen at. Um, if the U.S. military is going to be adequately resourced and adequately postured to meet those challenges. So um, it just the administration just needs to provide Congress with an accurate assessment of what their own needs are. And then if Congress doesn't want to meet those needs, then 
that's that becomes the main issue. But um, the, the kind of first step that has to happen is there has to be an accurate assessment of what is actually needed and a very open and transparent conversation about those requirements. Rather than currently, there's just a lot of beating around the bush and um, everybody wants to blame each other. And there's certainly a lot of blame to go around. But step one has to be like, let's accurately identify what the actual requirements are here. Um, and, and provide full transparency around that and what we think is needed both for Ukraine to win and for the United States military to um, have the resources that it needs for all of its uh, global demands. Yeah, thanks, Colby. Uh, John, is there anything you want to add about this whole thing? Uh, again, not really. Colby covered basically all the, all, all the major points of this in a very good level of detail. Yeah, it's like it's really kind of a procedural point, I guess. John, is that I don't know quite how to frame it exactly. They just need to be I, more mindful of the procedures, I guess. I, I'm trying to like exactly. simplify it. There's a lot of minutia, right? Go ahead. Yeah, I I don't think there's a, a good short explanation. Fundamentally, it's just so nuanced. Yeah, there is no. As I said a few times, there is no TLDR. Uh, I get that. A uh, hundred a uh, hundred tweets was like daunting for a lot of people. Um, but, uh, and I, as I've said, like this thread left an awful lot out. Uh, and I, I should say like the reason why the thread was written is just because there are, are so many people who ask me questions about like, how does the process work? What's going on with all these different aspects. So try to write a thread that would explain the issue because it is a very complicated and, um, nuanced issue, like what's happening. And I know the budgetary stuff is all very complicated. So. I did my best to explain that because I get tons of questions about this. Um, and, you know, some aspects of the situation are pretty simple. Like we all understand that Speaker Johnson doesn't really want to put uh, a foreign aid bill uh, on the floor. Like we all understand that he doesn't care about Ukraine. Like fundamentally, it's not something that he thinks is very important, even though he says um, that he does understand it. I don't believe that he deep down believes that it is very important. I think that he cares about other issues a lot more. Um, so it's not an important thing for him to do. That's pretty easy to understand for most people. So I don't need to write 100 tweets explaining that. That's something that's intuitive. But the, you know, the, what I wrote the thread about is a pretty complicated issue, like dealing with the legal authorities, how the replacement uh, funding works, all of the numbers involved. That's all pretty complicated. And there's nobody else that was uh, providing any sort of explanation about these topics. So it was something that needed to be written in, in my estimation. So that's the point behind it. But so much got left out of this thread. Like it's like PDA is incredibly complicated. There's like, I could write 200 tweets, 500 tweets probably about it. Um, there's so many different aspects involved that could be covered. So at some point you just have to cut it off. Um, but there's an, there's an awful lot. Um, there's an awful lot that can be talked about there because it's there's just so many different aspects to it. So uh, I, I covered the basics of like how the authority works um, a little bit on the on execution and then just a lot delving into the timeline of when things happened uh, and all the all the numbers behind it. Um, so hopefully uh, people understood it. I, I got you know overwhelming positive feedback from tons of people um, and uh, and um, yeah, so I'm, I'm overall happy with it, how it turned out, but uh, there's there's always things where, you think, oh, I could have added that, could have added that, um, and but it was already crazy long. So I appreciate everybody who uh, who stuck it out and, and read to the end. And you know, ultimately, it you know, people can make their own decisions if if it's, they think it's an important issue that they want to understand. If it is, then you know, read the thread. And if you don't care about the issue, then don't read the thread. Um, but a lot of people did, and I certainly appreciate it. Yeah, I think you know. Presidential drawdown authority it probably is going to become a more important issue uh, moving forward. Uh, so hopefully uh, people can can learn more about it. And uh, I, I would just say in general, hopefully like all future presidents uh, like are are able to use the the tool effectively because that's like the most I don't know that's that's the most important thing. And so uh, I don't think as you said it hasn't been used since Vietnam, but I think it's about to see a lot more use. So it's important now that we learn how it works and uh, make sure that like everyone's operating under the same understanding like congress the executive branch and and uh, the public and so forth so um yeah any any questions in chat or anyone in the panel have any questions 
I see there's a question from Callan Don. I'll pull it up. Um, yeah, for Colby, with respect to the net book value, is there a fixed percentage corresponding to the age of each weapon that must be used, or is this percentage subject to interpretation by the DOD? Uh, yeah, good question. It's it's not based on the age. It's based on the condition code of the asset. So the Department of Defense has um, different gradations that they use, grading systems to determine what the condition of their assets are. So um, all of those assets should have... Um, th I mean, there are a few different systems, but there are, um, for the purposes of uh, determining... Um, for drawdowns, there's, uh, or to determine netbook value, there's um, uh, there's a few different codes that they they use. So it's whatever code the asset has, and then there's a corresponding percentage um, for those different codes. So um, it's it's not just like it's if it's so many years old uh, then it's this, or if it's so many old years old it's that. Um, but there's there's no way f for us really to know. Um, you know, what all the different assets in DOD inventory, what their condition code is, is not publicly listed. Um, we could try and make estimates, but um, that's basically how, how it works. Okay, do we have any other questions about PDA? No. I don't see any, but there was I think a question. I, I put everybody to sleep, I think. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> it's quite an overwhelming topic. Uh, and I, I, um, yeah, I, I have difficulties understanding you know, all the different things, so I, I appreciate the explanation uh, personally. Uh, I see one question from Shuk Pui, um, but it's not relevant to PDA. It's something different, but maybe someone in the panel can answer it. Um, does any anyone uh, on the panel have any update regarding the discharge petition now that the recess is over? And I guess the, the news are not very positive, unfortunately. Uh, I, I posted in the thread uh, where the current status of signatures sat um, with the discharge petition. I don't know if any additional members have signed it since then. Um, I, I don't think so, but I may be wrong. But people can. I go think a couple them. of I think a couple of Democrats signed the last last week. A couple more, okay. So a few more signatures are are on there. Um, I whether anything happens with the discharge petition, I think is going to happen. Um, it, it depends on what happens this week. So um, there are a lot of members who are saying, it, especially in light of what's happening in the Middle East right now uh, with the Iranian attack against Israel that they would like to see the, the foreign aid bill um, move forward uh, this week. So if the speaker uh, is not willing to take up foreign aid in some shape or form, um, I, I don't think it uh, like, I don't think he has to necessarily just pass the supple Senate supplemental as is. Certainly there are um, Democrats think that that should be done. But as I explained in the thread, that actually wouldn't be very good for Ukraine um, because it just doesn't have enough aid in there uh doesn't have enough um doesn't have enough money for the dod either um uh, i told some other people that uh the missile the u.s missile defense agency should probably have its budget doubled right now given what we just saw in israel uh because right now it's but it's being cut so um i think they have a, like a 10 billion dollar budget that should probably be doubled right now um if the u.s wants to be serious about their own uh missile defense capabilities so uh, Congress needs to do some work on on the supplemental. Um, needs some significant improvements. So we'll see what what the speaker does this week. If he doesn't do anything, then I think that greatly increases the chance that more me members are going to be willing to sign the discharge petition. Um, so I guess we'll see over the next few days um, what he's willing to do with regard to foreign assistance bill. Yeah, people seem generally optimistic that it'll happen from what I can tell, but uh, the specifics uh, aren't, aren't entirely clear in terms of uh, what's when the signatures are going to happen. Uh, but I, I don't know.
any more questions? Uh, I think we're pretty much wrap, close, getting closer to wrapping up, uh, unless we have uh, questions from the chat. We, we do have uh, also uh, the, the German aid to Ukraine report uh, after, after uh, this. Uh, should, we, should we go to that, actually? Um, I think German aid, and then I have uh, losses data and possibly Daniele. Got it. Got it. Okay. Well, we should probably get get going then. Um, so yeah, thanks. Thanks for everyone uh, for this segment uh, on on the uh, PDA stuff. Uh, John, thanks for uh, the missile stuff. Colby, uh, you, you've been a, a publishing machine. So uh, yeah, thanks for uh, coming up to uh, share all your work. Uh, so yeah, we, we really appreciate it. Germinate, I think the floor is yours. Oh, I, I sorry, I um, totally missed the uh, opportunity. Yeah, um, hi. Um, just for your information, uh, I'm doing it a little bit differently this week, and I'm sorting uh, by topic rather than uh, by the day of the week. Um, just for your information. Um, we are starting um, with the martyrs. Um, in March, I reported here. Tochny that the German government has pledged another 20 mata, 183. I uh, German aid? Um, yeah. I think so, you're, we uh, have a problem with your uh, microphone. Oh, no. Yeah, it's it's not very it's not very nice. You're cracking up very badly. Okay, I'm reconnecting to another segment first, okay? Yeah. I think, okay, so while German aid is reconnecting, I guess we can watch it. You know, take a look at these uh, wonderful German paratroopers. Uh, does anyone else have something to say? By the way, Daniel, welcome. Hello. Sorry for jumping at the last minute. Well, well, yeah, I, I have actually. Um, you this week, uh, there was some Norway news, eh? Um, I actually meant to ask you about it, but I kind of there's there's a lot to this week. Um, so yeah, uh, we we heard some news from Norway. You want to share? I don't know. I was I was asleep. Uh, no, the F sixteen <laughs> stuff, right? Ah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Oh, well, well that's true. Yeah. So um, interesting news about F 16s Yeah. Um, so basically, uh, an article published uh, by Netavisen, which is a, a Norwegian um, a Norwegian um, news website, um, has uh, confirmed that 22 um, uh, F-16 MLUs are, ha have been given transfer authority by the US to Ukraine from Norway. Um, out of those 22, 12 are, uh, according to the journalists, which I also spoke to, um, uh, operational. So they're fully operational uh, aircraft. And 10 are flyworthy, but not... Uh, operational as uh, is today uh, and the reason why they're they were never on the table for Ukraine before is mainly been because um, it's been too ex or no sorry uh, to correct myself that why they were not for sale those 10 um, additional aircraft was because it was deemed too expensive to repair them or supply find um, spare parts to get them fully operational so they were uh, basically taken off the charts as uh, saleable objects. But uh, they've been um, destined for Ukraine, obviously, uh, and together with also um, a lot of different spare parts, a simulator, and different ground materials that uh, has to do with F-16. So, um, yeah, that's um, interesting. As far as, uh, as far as we know, there are two uh, constantly being used at a training mission in Denmark. and. Um, there is also, but there are also more aircraft that are being used at the training mission in Denmark. But some of them are currently at uh, just regular maintenance in Norway. So, between two and four or five aircraft are actually being used uh, in that mission right now. Yeah, so good news from Norway. A lot of good news from Norway lately, Erlen. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the good news from Norway that was. Uh, you know, the big, big news ha does not really have anything to do with Ukraine, although it might have good side effects. And it's uh, that we are basically uh, doubling our uh, defense budget uh, 
uh, over a number of years. Um, uh, we're adding two more uh, full brigades. Um, and yeah, it's pretty big. Uh, the, it's the largest expansion of the Norwegian military since uh, 1940. Yeah, since the Second World War. And hopefully that will bring some good, you know, stuff to Ukraine in, in some way or form. I think Germanade is back. Can you test your mic? Well. I don't know what to say. Are are, are you around? Mm. Might just need a moment. Just cut in whenever you can, Germanade. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, loud and clear. Yeah, I had to switch the microphone, so I have two headsets on right now. One for microphone, one for sound. <laughs> um because funny enough the other one is broken with the sound so yeah a little bit weird here um yeah should i start over again and you know yeah, yeah I, i'm very sorry for the um you know the trouble um yeah so just for information i'm doing it uh, a little bit differently this week um i'm sorting by topic rather than by the day of the week and um, we are starting uh, with something I have reported in March here, Tochny, um, because um, the German government has pledged another 20 Marder 103 IVs to Ukraine. Um, I reported that here. Um, Rheinmetall, so the, the manufacturer or the uh, company who overhauls these systems and then delivers it to Ukraine, recently stated in the press release that they actually integrate additional laser range finders, um, which enables them to uh, an efficient and precise target engagement. So um, just an info, very nice upgrade for the uh, Ukrainian models. Um, the German government has also updated their website and um, on military assistance to Ukraine and made public that they have delivered the following to uh, military aid to Ukraine in the recent two weeks. 16 Vector UAVs, 30 RQ-35 Hydron UAVs, one Bronco ATTC command vehicle, two Vs and one MC mine clearing tanks, three mine plows, 11 mobile remote controlled and protected demining devices, 5,000 blasting caps and uh, detonators, 120 CR um, 308 uh, rifles, 50 HLR 338 sniper rifles, 680 MK556 assault rifles. So these are all rifles from uh, Siege Hennel, uh, a German uh, producer. Um, 1, 000, uh, 1 million rounds of firearm ammunition. Um, 30 frequency range extensions for drone uh, anti-drone devices, 70 R, uh, IR devices, and 24 outboard motors. Oh, hard English here for me as a German. Um, so yeah, as always, a consistent flow of military aid uh, to Ukraine from, from Germany. Uh, we are now coming to the topic uh, Patriot Air Defense. Um, first, we are starting with an announcement by Germany's Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock. She announced that Germany is working with Ukraine and EU partners or U um, European partners on setting up a special fund to purchase Patriot systems that are worldwide in service with different nations uh, and deliver them to Ukraine. Um, new information on the matter is to provide it soon, but I think that's a great approach, um, although it can be expect th uh, expected that the matter uh, will take some time. Um, to actually answer a question which I think I will get um, soon is um, from which countries can we expect it? Um, I think that Jordan and Qatar might be um, good countries because um, Germany has, for example, already bought back the, um, the Gepards from Qatar and delivered them to Ukraine without an issue. Just takes a lot of money, you know. Um, the US has, in cooperation with Germany, uh, also bought back uh, cheetahs from um from Jordan and is about to deliver them to uh, Ukraine. So I think these two nations um, are a great uh, starting point. 
Um, coming to additional very, very good news. Um, yesterday, the German MOD announced that Germany will provide another Patriot battery to Ukraine. Uh, sadly, right now, there's no information if another crew um, has to be trained or not. Uh, so it might take uh, two weeks or maybe two months until Ukraine can actually use it. Uh, we don't know that yet. Um, according to information from Spiegel, um, the German government hopes to motivate other nations to also supply patriots to Ukraine. Um, the German Minister of Defense, Boris Pistorius, and the German uh, Foreign Minister, Annalena Baerbock, are set to make phone calls with allied countries in the next days. Um, on the same day, the Ukrainian President Zelensky also announced that Ukraine is working with Germany on the provision of another IRIS TSLM system. Um, this will be the fourth IRIS TSLM system provided by Germany and was already, so the system was already expected at the end of the 2023-2024 uh, winter. Yeah, and that's my uh, short summary of German aid to Ukraine for this week. Thank you very much, Germany to Ukraine. Uh, so, Erland, uh, you said you you also have a segment. Is that well? Yeah. So it's kind of uh, back to um, to um, Daniela first, I guess. But yeah, I I wasn't here last week, so it didn't happen. But um, kind of starting this, uh, we started this um, weekly thing I want to do, where we we bring up the losses from uh, from Andrew. But um, I guess. Uh, we, it, it makes more sense to start with the FPV stuff that Daniela has. Yep, yeah. and um, th thank you, Herland, for bringing these back. Uh, this is like um, a new graphics that I, I'm trying to produce in order to show in the best way as possible the data. In reality, this is taken from the, the paper that I, the, the article that I'm quite I'm writing right now, but this one has been a lot of work because uh, in the database we have um, a serious amount of a serious amount of uh, tank data. So essentially, different type of tank um, um, hit by different type of weapon, and one of these is FPV, of course. So what you see here is um, only the strikes with FPV on tanks. Uh, these include any type of tanks from T-72, T-64, T-80, T-90, everything. So um, this is done uh, for a simple reason, because if we go too much in granularity, then we can't see the trends. So uh, this data is quite encouraging, because as you can see and um, show you the so you have a number on the top of each bar which is the total number of uh, events on tanks and um, the blue one are the damage and as you can see the most of uh, uh, the strike concluded with a damage the a damage means that the tank is not usable anymore and um, one of one good things is that um, uh, most of the time is very difficult for both sides, but especially also for the Russian, which use much more vehicle to retrieve this damaged vehicle because they don't have enough um, recovery vehicle. And often uh, these vehicles that then are uh, essentially damaged by FPV are finished by other FPV or uh, drone dropped. Most of the time drone drop, which is much uh, cheaper. And um, if the, when you see destroyed, of course, this destroyed means that the, the tank has been catastrophically exploded with one single hit, essentially. Um, and, and you can see it's a, it's a minority, of course. Of, uh, I would say that this is possibly due to the how difficult it is to, to hit a, a moving target, but also because uh, FPV ha have a li limited amount of warhead and um, and so it's quite difficult to strike in an efficient way and it's very important to underline that at the moment where while, while we speak uh, ukraine is developing a lot of uh, um, warheads uh, dedicated to do to do this so it's very likely that uh, with the time fpv will become more and more lethal also for armored vehicle there is another slide which is quite interesting which is the bmp one and uh, the BMP-1, uh, as you can see, sh show you a, a very interesting results, which if you follow the conflict, you understand that 
this data is quite reasonable because um, you can see like going constant between uh, September, October, this, essentially between, between October and, and December is quite constant, but then it starts to increase quite a lot. And the reason is because uh, after December, the Russians start to push on different points and they start to do this uh, in a very common uh, way. So with the um, column of inf infantry fight bacon trying to push as much as possible and bring as much manpower, manpower I had. So this vehicle, of course, encountered uh, a lot of resistance. Because I didn't, I'm not showing you here the entire uh, database for BMP, which is much, much larger, nearly double on, uh, on all the BART. But um, you can see that in terms of uh, FPV, FPV in the last three months have done a lot in terms of um, damaging and destroying um, BMPs. Of course, we include BMP 1, 2, and, and 3. So uh, there is no distinction here between the, the different types. And of course, because BMP is uh, much less uh, armored, the number of uh, the, the percentage of destroyed is much higher. Did you include BMDs and other APCs? In this? No, no. APC. Oh. These are only IFV. Okay. We can we we can do a separate section, and probably I will for BTR and other armored uh, person personal carrier. I think it's more fair because they they are used for the same things, but in theory are uh, even less armored, less capable. But yes, we we can do that uh, very 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 easily. Now, before it was a bit of a heck to, to have these plots consistently. Yeah, thank you. And oh, um, we also have this uh, uh, very nice, oh, yeah, uh, very nice uh, new graphic from our uh, dedicated graphic designer. Shout out. Uh, thank you so much, Chris, um, um, uh, which are basically um, compiling the, the losses from, from Andrew and, and Geek. Um, and uh, it's all the different losses. Uh, uh, the, yeah, the, these are the selected categories. I, I think there's an error at the AFV, or is it possible, Daniela, that there was no AFVs in the last week? This is on, only only one week. Yes, only one week. Yeah. Um, eh, unlikely, but uh, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised because. Um, yeah, it could it could be possible, but it, it would be good to have a look because um, I'm, I'm it's gonna very strange. I'm gonna check that. Uh, but anyways, uh, yeah, I mean the the losses. Oh, from Chris, the last, last... Chris replied. Chris replied in the no error, so no FV. That that that's, that's yeah. Good. But I'm uh, I'm thinking maybe the the error might be from somewhere else, not from ah, Chris's. Uh, okay. Not from Chris's mistake in this case. I I I know that. Yeah, that's not his fault in case. But yeah, uh, anyways, the losses are absolutely staggering. I think it's inc incredible. And if you follow Andrew on Twitter, then you've seen him publishing uh, the losses. The last couple of weeks have been an incredibly demand demanding week and two or month, I would say, when it comes to documenting all these losses. Um, it's it's kind of crazy. And I, I took the for comparison. I took. I also brought this one, which is two weeks ago, and the losses are nearly double. Yeah. Yeah, and these are total losses, right? These are total losses, uh, but only in these categories here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that there is there is an increase and. Uh, and it's interesting if you if you go back to the to the FPV one and you look at the tank, uh, you, you will see also uh, like a trend that we seen together for a general differential behavior of the usage of FPV, and you can see that there is a sinking in in, um, in December in terms of strikes on uh, on tank. And this is this follow the the plot the the, the same uh, the same uh, bar chart that I made in, uh, to see the difference in the strikes between Russia uh, between uh, Ukrainian and Russian. So the, in December you ha we had that um, very alarming uh, um, 
close up of the Russian uh, on on Ukrainian FPV attack, but then uh, they, they never they never catch up. And in fact, you can see that essentially even the the strikes on tank increased in the same way. I mean, March has been a nightmare, and who knows how happy BMP have been always increasing. <laughs> But this trend is more visible probably because of the are less maybe i still are studying this data yeah but i think it, uh, this all reflects what the russians are sending to the front really yeah yeah but yeah uh there was a question why is it zooming in so much um there was a question if uh uh if there are um if there are thermobaric weapons available for FPV drones, and yeah, the the answer is yes. The thermobaric uh, warheads have been used from both sides on FPV drones. Uh, firstly, we saw uh, repurposed RPG um, thermobaric warheads, but like real quick, Alan, what's a thermobaric warhead? Go ahead. Oh my God, uh, I think Daniela should explain that. But there are some gases and crazy things. It basically, happening. uses the oxygen in the air as a fuel. Or actually, that's not a good explanation. It Go spreads like some. Uh, yeah, Daniela, do you know the technical terms of it? Yeah, it's a, now the. I think it spreads like the aer- I, I think a, it spreads aerosols. Before yeah, it it's a, essentially, the, the main the main. Uh, um, Way on how these these warheads works in spraying or nebulizing, uh, creating a mist of very flammable uh, substance. Normally, is a fuel you, you can do with diesel. I mean, and um, and because this mist stays into the air, then there is a secondary explosion that essentially creates a ball of fire. That, that's it. Now it's called vacuum bomb from the media. There is like oxygen sucking bomb, but these are all. Uh, big words just for um, uh, the so some type of, of newspaper, but in reality, they tend to uh, work as a very efficient incendiary warhead, and they are very good because uh, this mist can propagate in uh, in empty in uh, in closed space very well, and so the secondary will ignite this uh, fuel that essentially is penetrated within. For example, a building or a bunker or uh, a trench. Okay, good. So sorry, uh, sorry to cut you off there. I just want to make sure everyone understood what we were talking about. Uh, so we were saying they can be put on drones now, which sounds terrifying. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, and there, I've also seen that the, there are now custom-made thermobaric warheads uh, for FPV drones because. Um, the, the repurposed uh, warheads, the, the problem with them is that they're generally way too heavy. Um, the weight to to explosive ratio is, is quite terrible for an FPV drone because they're made to be fitted on a you know rocket. And when you're on an FPV drone, that's not needed. So you can use a lot less uh, heavy materials to make the explosive devices. And that's just a general thing with all the generally... With all the purpose-made um, munitions for FPV drones and drone drops munitions in general, um, if they're made purposely for drones, then you'll get a lot more effect um, from from you know how how uh, heavy they are basically, which also affects the range of the drone and everything else. Yep, um, I guess we can go to Q and A now. Yeah, if we have any other questions from chat. Yeah, there was um, a couple. I'll, I'll pr- try and go to the top because there was one first that we forgot in, in the beginning. Um, one sec. Um, it was from Kellen. Okay, I'll read it first. Um, yeah, so are Ukrainian air defenses uh, getting depleted? Uh, things like Patriot, Interceptors. Uh, and uh, then I keep reading that uh, Ukraine only has a few weeks left of air defense interceptors. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the the inventory of interceptors is a growing problem that is reaching critical levels. 
Uh, and I don't think I'll elaborate beyond that. Um, obviously, this is something that we've been hearing from for a while. Um, so skepticism is is warranted because the White House, as I pointed out, has been saying this for a long time. Um, and this is part of the broader issue around their communications and their messaging. But uh, right now, yes, things are rapidly reaching a critical point. Yeah, thank you, Colby. There's also another missile question here, and John, of course, jumped out. So I guess I'll direct this one to Colby too. Why do the Russians use so many air defense missiles, uh, mainly S-300 and S-400s, as ballistic strike missiles? Do they have so many of them that they don't care or don't think they may need them? Uh, yes, Russia has a very deep inventory of interceptors for its... S-300, S-400 family of systems. Um, when the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense published their um, their most recent estimate or comprehensive estimate, I believe was from last year. Um, but back then they assessed that Russia had like thousands of uh, those interceptors for S-300, S-400. So there are quite a lot of them. And um, as John said, we don't have great visibility into uh, the total number of those that are being used, they aren't reported to the same degree that some of these other systems are. Um, but Russia, yeah, Russia has a lot. So they they feel comfortable using them uh, in the surface to surface role. And I would suspect that a lot of the ones that are being used are probably the older missiles. Although I don't know that for certain, but just logically, they're probably using... Um, some of the older interceptors, um, and they're certainly going to save the newer, more capable ones um, to actually to do uh, you know, air defense and anti-ballistic missile defense in the case of like S three hundred V. So I, I I don't think that they 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 feel comfortable that they're not compromising um, compromising their air defenses. Uh, yeah, I just pulled up. Um, uh, just on my screen, I, um, I have a picture saved. Uh, they had 8,000 S-300 interceptors of various sorts at the start of the war for the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense's um, assessment, and 1,000 of those had been used by November 2022. Um, so I don't know. They, I don't know if they've quite used half of that so far, but it's certainly, uh, I would guess, probably somewhere in the 3,000 range at least have been fired probably uh, but john um, that's something as he said he's working on trying to fill in some of the gaps around the missiles that we don't know a whole lot about in terms of their employment rates yeah thank you um and then the next question is for germinate i guess um from kellen again um for germinate is the new patriot pack 2 or Pack three. How many launchers uh, does you, the Ukrainian crew have have to be trained? So you answered some of this, I think, uh, in your segment. But um, do you know about the pack two or pack three? Um, no, I do not. Um, I think it's pack two because um, they said it's possible to deliver them because of um, other systems which came from the industry due to modernization. Um, so I think they just got an upgraded system, right, a uh, uh, PEG-3 one, and delivered, um, therefore, or can uh, have, have spare capacity to deliver a PEG-2 to Ukraine. That's just my uh, my best guess. There's no confirm, uh, confirmed uh, information on this right now. Um, how many launchers? Um, the German government is still negotiating with Ukraine on the matter. Um, I would say um, six is the minimum. Um, although I, I really don't know. I, I wish um, that John would be here because I know that Germany has supplied two extra launchers. I know that the Netherlands has supplied two extra launchers. Um, I believe, like, how many got confirmed destroyed? Two launchers, right, including missiles, so we can like remove two. Um, and have two in spare. So if we deliver a system maybe with uh, four launchers, we can add these two, uh, the, the extra ones. And uh, then we still have a fully functional system because in Germany, all systems are at minimum six launchers. So it's it's not that it's a 
weak system. I mean, weak is the wrong description anyway, but I hope you know what I mean. And um, regarding the training, um, I think that I already mentioned that um, there is currently no information if Ukrainian crews have to be trained or not. Um, I know that Spain, for example, trained uh, maintenance personnel on the Patriot. So um, I, it might be the case that um, if we get an experience and we need to train, we get an experienced uh, crew and uh, maybe one of the crews which already received maintenance training in Spain. So we have, I really don't know how, how long that would take, but it, maybe it's a week less than normal. Um, so maybe um, a crew, when they arrive in Germany, could be trained within five weeks at max six. I believe the first time Germany trained Ukrainian personnel was seven or eight weeks. The second uh, battery we delivered to Ukraine was, I believe, one week less than um, the first one. And um, if we now get a crew which already received maintenance training, for example, in Spain, um, maybe additional training. I, I really don't know if Spain is or uh, also training on on other um, things regarding Patriot. Um, maybe we can deliver a system when they are in Germany um, after five weeks, six at max. Yeah. Just want to add that if if Ukraine did their job properly, prob uh, properly, uh, they did perform on the job training with personnel in Ukraine, um, basically uh, taking in um, soldiers who didn't have any experience on, on Patriot air defense missile uh, uh, systems and brought them in as uh, um, basically apprentices uh, on the job. Um, that is a normal um, procedure during a uh, like a military mobilization and, and when you need to uh, mobilize large parts of the population. And I know they did this with other air defense systems and other uh, weapon systems in general. So hopefully they did that so that they have a larger pool of personnel they can take off. The big question I have now is um, like, how can you um, actually do that with, with Patriot? Because Ukraine only has three systems, right? Three batteries for the whole um country right how how efficient can you actually um train on the fly uh during war times or on these systems right it's not like they have like 20 systems in, in storage and they you know they, they have three for the whole country and it's used every day basically you will have to just have soldiers um tagging along the already trained crew learning uh you know, on the fly, what how the system works, and there's a lot of downtime, down and um, I'm sure that they could pick up a lot of different things. If you do okay. that properly, you can fully train a crew, even though there is not during wartime. Okay, and of course, you will uh, you will not have the the same routine as when you're training in a peacetime scenario, and the whole time is dedicated to training. So it would take you know a lot longer time, but they've had. Uh, the systems in country for quite a long time now so uh, i would hope that they did this uh no information about it but that that would be natural also because yeah. they need to expand the crews for for rotation and just precaution measures no yeah, because the, the question i uh, now have is why they didn't do this like the first time right they got two systems uh two, two batteries sorry uh john is killing me uh, two batteries, uh, one from the US, one from Germany, and we still had to train uh, Ukrainian personnel last year, like in November. I I can't answer that question, but I mean, you would generally want an experienced crew to 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 do on the job training with with new people. I I mean they they operated the the system for like how long? Five months, six months, um, that time. So yeah, I, I just want to highlight, you know, they they didn't do it um, like the training in Ukraine the first time we supplied an additional system, right? And like why maybe, of course, now the, um, the, the crew is more experienced and they say, okay, we have enough experience to actually train our own personnel. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm always skeptic. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, I mean you, you would want uh, instructors for certain roles, definitely. Um, there are some roles you can't just, you know, train on the job, for sure. But yeah, I, I hope they did it because it would it would help them a lot if um, there were, you know, possible transfer within weeks of uh, new systems. Yeah. My understanding is that there have been efforts to train more personnel in country, but John would be the best, best person to speak to that. But I, I think that that is happening to some extent. Um, I, I also want to add on the new battery. So even if that battery only comes with three or four launchers, that still can be very effective. Like it doesn't need to have six launchers to be effective. The key piece of this is that it's a full battery with a radar and an engagement control station. And then if it only has three or four batteries instead of six, that still means that that battery can be deployed somewhere else uh, in the country away from the other ones to give more geographical coverage. It could go to the front or it could just protect Odessa or Kharkiv uh, or some other lo location because if you just send more launchers, then those launchers have to be tied to one of the existing batteries, which are going to be elsewhere. So receiving an additional battery, even if it doesn't have as many launchers as you might want to have, um, given if we look at uh, you know John's raid data, the Russian raids, although there are some big ones, most of them are a little bit smaller. So with three or four launchers, it's still going to be capable of um, intercepting a, a number of incoming missiles in quick succession. So the Russians would have to dedicate a lot of assets to overwhelm it. Uh, obviously that risk decreases the more launchers you have, but the United States actually deploys its Patriot um, uh, assets in like a minimum, minimum configuration sometime. I forget exactly what it is, but sometimes they might only have like one or two launchers, I think, um, rather than having a complete, their complete battery organization. Um, so, the number of launchers is not really a, a critical piece for if it doesn't have this this number, then it's not going to be an effective fighting um, unit. So the fact that they're getting, uh, if they are getting a, a full, full battery, um, then that's helpful. And of course, other countries, if they're not willing to, to provide um, their own batteries, they can maybe top it up with um, some extra launchers like the Netherlands did before. Okay, I'm going to jump to some more drone questions. Um, and yeah, Chris had another question. Um, and I think this is quite relevant um, and actual right now. Uh, are relay drones being used significantly more by Ukraine to extend uh, drone range and avoid EW? Does Russia use them too? Yes, definitely both uses uh, relay drones. There have been uh, evidence, uh, both video and and footage from Russians, you know, demonstrating their own relay drones. Um, my hunch, and this is really just a hunch from observation because I've not been doing any statistical analysis of this at all, is that uh, Ukraine might have the edge on this uh, field. Um, there's definitely more, I've, I've, I've def definitely seen more different uh, relay drones from Ukraine. Um, and there's also been a lot of reports uh, uh, just observing different um, Russian telegram groups that uh, they have really big problems um, because of these relay drones, because it, um, it, it makes their EW less effective. Uh, Daniela, you've been looking at a lot of these things too. What Do you have any comments to that? No, I think I think you you replied very well. And the the only other things that I want to say is that these relay drones uh, are used very carefully from both sides, because uh, as the Russian has learned uh, in the hard way, relay drones are a very big um, electromagnetic signature. So uh, sometimes it happens that they can be used to track down pilots. So they need to be used wisely. But they are, yes, they have been used for sure to extend the, the, the range. I'm not sure about um, overcoming EW because in the end, uh, um, EW 
at least there are different types, but normally it hits the frequency that the drones use. So um, the, un unless the, the, there is like some kind of frequency hopping technique or some kind of software um, uh, hardening of of the of, of the trans transmissions it's very likely that the the, the, the mothership that this uh, this relay drone is not going to make any difference on that regards but for sure they can extend definitely the range yeah i was trying to look for um uh, i remember a drone strike that was um i think about 35 to 40 kilometers behind uh, enemy lines uh, into Russian held territory. Um, and I think it hit a, a tour or, or a book. I'm not, I don't remember, uh, but I couldn't find it now. Um, but yeah, that, it definitely extends the range. And um, Ukraine has been using this for a very long time, but they've, they have been careful about using it. That's, that's true. And uh, our favorite Magyar is using it a lot, by the way. Yeah. In fact, I think I've, I've seen most uh, uh, a spike of use of this type of technique in Krinky, when, where they were attacking very far away from the, the beachhead. Yeah. Um, and then there is a... You know, I didn't think this would, would happen. Uh, I haven't listened to this episode, even though I've been sent the link to it by many people. Uh, the, so Robin has a question about, um, yeah, so on on the War on the Rocks pod this week with Kaufman and Lee, uh, they said, while they appreciate the Tochny uh, statistical collection, it must be missing something given that everyone in Ukraine told them uh, the Russians had more drones. Any thoughts? Yeah, I, I just want to say that this is something we've been, you know, I wouldn't say necessarily criticized, but like asked by many people over and over again. Um, and uh, yeah, the same message comes basically from everywhere in Ukraine. They, they, or from many people in Ukraine, they say, ah, oh, the Russians have so much more, many more drones. But, uh, and it might be true that they have more, but I don't think it is a significant amount. Well, I think I, my, first off, it's awesome to hear that they're talking about us some more on the rocks. Like that's, you know, we all have list, we're all familiar with that podcast. So that's cool. But my question would be, so none of us have, have listened to it as far as I can clarify, I'll certainly go listen to it, but did they make, did they understand the distinction between FPV? Like they, if they, did they just say drones? Like, do they, do they understand there's a difference between FPV drones and drones in general? Because if they think that's just some kind of a semantic difference or something, the numbers aren't going to make sense, right? I, like, that would be the first thing I would say. Like, does anyone know? Well, if if all the different drones were included in the stats and all the videos of drone drop munitions as well were included, but we don't have the breakdown on all those videos, so the stats are not necessarily as, as reliable on that because we would have basically need... Uh, we would need 10 more gigs and Andrews to do that. Um, as far as I understand, the the statistics would have been even more in favor of Ukraine. So I yeah, guess I can, only speak, to those. I can only speak to like how actually familiar with our data are they? Like, do they understand it's just FPV drone strikes? Like, I guess you have to go and ask, ask Kaufman and Lee. Yeah, and that their anecdotal question of like well everyone's saying russia has more drones like did they ask anyone about fpv drones because it doesn't really seem like a useful anecdote if they didn't does that make sense yeah i understand um well i kind of lost my train of thought daniel can you maybe answer yes so i i i'm going to listen to the podcast that is a podcast yeah Okay, I, I will go and listen. So I, I will make uh, maybe a direct reply to the to the guys. So the I think this apart from this particular mention, these things have been uh, raised a lot of times, and a lot of times I replied with the same answer that first of all uh, we don't take um, all the drone strikes, and the reason uh, are different. The first one is that. Is impossible for the sheer number of FPV drone strikes that are currently happening 
to record all of them and process all of them. And this requires a lot of uh, commitment. So the, 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 there must be people sitting on a computer to assemble this video and distributing this video. So for sure, they are going not to send out all of them. And of course, there are also strikes that didn't have success, which we will never end up. Or strike that has success, but the video is crap, so they are not going to use. So there is for sure a bunch of data that is missing. That, that's for sure. But there are two main points that I always remind. First, that the, the, the purpose of this study is not to, to establish the complete and exact uh, amount of drone strikes done by each side, but it's trying to have a trend. It's trying to study the trend and try to study how these drones have been used by using a monthly or more than monthly, because now we, we are more than six months in these, try to see if the trends meet certain requirements. First of all, we should see correspondence with increase or decrease with production, news from people that manufacture the drone, operation on the ground. For example, the, the data from tank and, and BMP, I know that they are not all, likely, because this means that they lost much more, but we can correlate these with actual action on the on the on the field. And a few weeks ago, I did uh, all my effort to, to try to demonstrate another important thing: that when you talk with people that is on the ground, you have to be careful because you can interview a, a, a soldier or an officer that is coming from one side of the of the front line, and in, in that, that front line all is fine in terms of drone. And then you ask the same question to another person 200, 500 kilometers away, and it, it tells you that he's hell on earth. So what, what is the real situation then? So going anecdotal is always risky. It, it can give you some, you know, some, uh, some input, especially on the location where you are asking the question. But then you need the data. And at the moment, the only data that is... Uh, somehow reliable because it is done in a very professional way, in a very unbiased way, is the Andrew data, Andrew and Geek data. And I also had, until now, access to it. I can ask us any question I want. I can verify if there was a mistake. Any other database that, exi that may exist, for example, this lost armor from this Russian OSINT, who on purpose removes the strikes, the, the stri Ukrainian strikes, Cannot be, can it, cannot be trusted. From my scientific background, I would never trust a person that removes data from its data point. For example, Andrew, keep the, the, the duplicates, but put a D, in, there is a column which we populate in order to say that that data published is a duplicate. So even if you have it on the database, you know what it is. And this, this is the best you can do. Plus, most of the data is geolocalized, so we can see where actually the strike happened. So, yeah, there is also another point, and then I conclude my, my, my explanation, is that we spoke with people who produce drones, and they told us, look, probably in, in order of usage, it's true, Ukraine is using a lot, but in terms of uh, overall quantity, Russian may have an edge, but... The edge is only because they produce a very low quality, which do not reach the target. In fact, they told us that Russian have around 10% of reaching the target, which doesn't mean hitting or destroying the target. And instead, the double, um, Wild Ornet, for example, has 30%. So if you take the number that I published a few weeks ago in the total, you will immediately see that Russian has more, but not uh, 600,000 just a few 10,000 more. And this was the entire effort that I tried to make, try to demonstrate that they were lying. They are not saving drone for a phantomatic uh, offensive. They are not employing all the drones that they have. I mean, they are, but it's not the number that they say. I, ho I hope that these uh, reply to the question. I think, um, Joseph, you can might maybe give some consideration about um, how anecdotal data or uh, qualitative data can be used in such a study. Uh, because I think Daniel kind of hit the nail when 
it can definitely be used for a localized study in a, a geographical localized area. Uh, but when it comes to um, to the general statistics or um, uh, let's say the the force uh, composition overall all, all over the front line. I think anecdotal data is kind of a, a problematic uh, data point. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Like, I think we've seen a lot of, I guess, what we would call defense analysts um, in the public sphere or who are advising governments um, like that. Look, I'll put it this way, right? I mean, obviously, I think no one here is suggesting that the data that we, we're we providing is perfect or that the data that Andrew and Gick are collecting is perfect. Um, but it is, uh, I think, I think we want, I want to contrast it with like, what are we comparing it against, right? And like a lot of the experts kind of, that's what they're, they keep kind of going back to is they say, well, I heard this or I heard that. And I just don't know. It's It doesn't appear to me to be a particularly systemic approach to getting anecdotal information. In other words, uh, like, I, I don't know, I, I worked in the social sciences, and we certainly collected information from humans all the time. Uh, we did interviews, we had structured interviews, we had unstructured interviews, we had, you know, whole boards that we had to explain our process for collecting information. Uh, and we had to get approval to do those things, we had to do it in an ethical manner. I'm not really getting the same um, vibe of thoroughness from these defense experts in terms of the anecdotal information they're hearing. Like, I'm not, you know, I'm not dismissing what they're saying out of hand, like in, in this particular circumstance, it might be correct. But I don't know, I think a lot of times it's like, yeah, sure, there's probably flaws in the data, like, that's probably true. But like, what are we exactly comparing it against? We're comparing it against like stuff people heard from places like, I don't know, I would just like to see them present a more systemic analysis of trends in social media usage of ter the term drone in Russian telegram or Ukrainian telegram. Um, I'd like to see more structured or um, properly sourced and published uh, interviews or systematic collections of data about, you know, this uh, information that they have uh, in order for it to be used more effectively by governments to make decisions. That would be like my, my hot take on all of it, um, which is, I guess I'll put it this way. I don't think there's anything wrong with um, anecdotal information or getting information from human sources. But I would like to see them take a more systematic approach. And that could be very informative for us because we have a very different approach to data. I think that the two approaches could mesh very well. Um, and yeah, we, I don't know. I appreciate like all the work that people are doing um, to get information from soldiers on the front line. And I hope they like continue to do it and they maybe uh, continue to improve their collection methods. I'll, I'll leave it at that. So your your rant wasn't over, Daniela? No, it wasn't a rant. <laughs> no, the, the last thing is that um, you remember the first time we published uh, um, a proper um, the, the post, one of the first posts that we published that was also uh, some of the stat were, were taken even from uh, Minister Kamishin. You remember what happened on, this, on the Russian Telegram channel? That was very unedicted. I, I mean, it was, was a was information given by people just randomly speaking. And we had that this, there were a lot of people confirming the data, especially people that say that they were soldier or former soldier. So, but in that case, we didn't come to the conclusion, oh, the data is absolutely exactly nailed. We just say they took in account, mm, maybe, maybe we are not far from what, what we see, but that's it because we can't, uh, evaluate the, the the quality of that type of information because we don't have a control over it. Unless the data we can analyze and you know balance a little bit the um, the weight of each um, entry of that data. For example, the fact that we can geolocate, we can uh, um, analyze uh, in time what's going on. We can look at things daily, monthly. Uh, gave us some more uh, control in order to understand even if there is just a mistake in how we process the data or stuff like that. In all other aspects, we can't because we are uh, um, essentially constrained by the information that arrives from a source that tell us something. Yeah, 
I just also want to add that uh, it's very important to note that Russian FPV drones poses a significant threat to, to Ukrainian forces, and it's a very big problem, even though um, the our stats are showing that the Ukraine, Ukrainians have a significant lead um, on strikes uh, that are observed. Uh, we definitely know that the, it is a big problem on the Ukrainian side too. I think I'm going to try and run through uh, the last uh, questions because we're going very over time here. But uh, um, Chris again, um, if do you foresee drones being used by either side against slow moving helicopters? So for footage this week of a Russian drone following Ukrainian helicopter drone and drone taken down by uh, EW. Uh, well, we've certainly seen some attempts both from both sides. Um, not sure if it's if it's ever going to be successful. That's kind of my answer to that. And again, Chris, do you foresee drones? Oh no, that's the same. Oh, double posting. Uh, probably some YouTube uh, problem. Um, yeah. Um, Gepards or any other radar equipped asset in the path of the. Oh no, sorry, that was not a question. <laughs> um. Yeah, I think that's more or less everything. I think and we're glad. We're definitely glad to see people giving the data consideration, though, and we're glad that they said they found it useful. And uh, like, I don't know, we're, we look forward to like, uh, I don't know, engaging with more people in the information sphere about like what's going on in Ukraine. I think is that maybe a good takeaway from our uh, our reasons. And then I, I guess I would say like Daniela, you're you're working on some new stuff uh in terms of like presentation i don't quite know how to put it um for the website uh i've seen i've seen some cool stuff i don't know how far along it is that we can we can show it to the good people yet um in terms of uh using the website to track drone strikes and stuff well a question or a yeah, yeah, I just like I remember you showing me like, oh, here's some stuff I've been working on, and it looked really like cool. Um, like what you could do, you could track all the drone strikes. Uh, is it, it it's already done on the website, or is it? Uh... Oh no, no, no. I am. Um, I mean, uh, on the website, we, I, I, I with Erland, we, we put most of uh, the the written research, which is good because it, it will stay. But yes, we can. Uh, the data is so well geolocalized that you can uh, very much identify with the pinpoint precision where strikes happen. And um, and um, this this is the heat map. This is old, so you can zoom as much as you want. You can see everything. And um, but uh, uh, at, at the moment, I'm working on uh, on an update, which will be released as soon as possible uh, with the, all the data of March uh, in order to explain a little bit what happened in Adifka and uh, what we may expect in the future so hopefully next week it will be out yeah and uh, i just wanted to also give some highlight to this new initiative that we launched which is basically uh something that would help out in getting this data even more uh into um well even more detailed and maybe we can use um more of the data for this kind of analysis uh, so basically, we're uh, recruiting uh, for Andrew's basement. Um, if you want to sit in Andrew's basement, you can uh, you can apply through this uh, contact form on the website. So if you go to touchne.info, you'll find a link here. And uh, uh, I would say that the most important thing is uh, to mention why you're mo motivated. Um, to do this and if you have any skills that you think are relevant. Um, and then the main tasks that uh, actually I'm going to add a new line here because Andrew asked me to. Um, uh, the main tasks that, uh, for new con contributors are uh, basically breaking down videos. Um, so that might be drone videos or uh, any other footage uh, that are uh, compilations. And uh, and then there's the, a very important task, which is uh, um, uh, basically going through uh, a list of uh, of channels where um, Andrew 
and and some other people who volunteer for that uh, have been breaking down uh, police reports and news reports from different um, uh, districts and and regions and um, in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, anything that is relevant to the war is being inserted into his map and also to the database. Uh, this is very important work because uh, it could um, help um, basically documenting, um, yeah, for historical purposes and also if, if, if it comes to down to even war crimes investigations, when and where something happened at any point in time. And um, yeah. Uh, we are taking uh, applications, and uh, uh, any help uh, would would definitely be uh, be appreciated because the workload that uh, Andrew and Gick and and a few other volunteering volunteers on this team um, have right now is just incredible because there's just so many more videos being published compared to before. Yeah, like every month there's more videos published than the month before, right? So and it's the same number of people doing the job. Uh, and yeah, they're starting to get get to their wits end, I think. Yeah, you, you, you can look at the at the trend of the FPV ju just for FPV and see how terrible it have to be. Each of those uh, uh, number, I mean, is a video, nearly each one is a video or portion of a video. Okay, boys, do we have anything else we want to wrap up with? Or I think we can probably close it out, huh? I think we're good. Okay, well, uh, thanks so much to our live audience for tuning in this week. Uh, we hope everyone uh, got, got some good information about what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, as was mentioned, the discharge petition is still ongoing. There's a, a few representatives. So if you're a U.S. citizen, at least, uh, maybe... Give your uh, legislators a little contact form and uh, or maybe a phone call and let them know uh, how you feel about Ukraine. Um, and as uh, Erlen said, please head over to our website if you're interested in just head over to our website in general, everybody. But in particular, if you're interested in helping with Andrew's uh, geolocation project and keeping track of all the, the videos coming out of Ukraine um, and, and the mapping and all that that Andrew Perpetua does, uh, please do uh, check out that application. Um, please like and subscribe, uh, like the stream and subscribe to Tochni uh, for more updates. Uh, sometimes we do do interviews or things not quite on schedule, but for the most part, we stream live every week just like this at, at this time. Uh, so uh, yeah, you're more than welcome to tune in. And uh, thanks everyone for uh, tuning in this week. Thanks to our panel for uh, providing a bunch of great, great segments and great information. And uh, we'll see everybody next week. Slava Ukraini. I'm Slava. I'm Slava. On behalf of...